Good morning and welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman with Brad Smith. Happy Jobs Friday, everybody. Let's talk about expectations for the numbers quickly here. We are looking for a non-farm payroll, the consensus estimate from economists, 195,000, Brad, unemployment rate, three and a half percent, and average hourly earnings seen rising at a 4.4% rate year over year, 0.3% rate on a month over month basis. That would be a slowdown, by the way, in the rate of increase for those average hourly earnings. Yes, yeah, several things that we're going to be thinking about leading into this report. One area that I'm continuing to keep an eye on as has come up in many of our conversations this week is not just the expectation that some of the firms like Citi are looking for, or some of the economists that we've had on, on the headline number are looking for, but also on the wage front and how that continues to play into mm -hmm. the broader inflationary environment. Now, if, if, if you ask the San Francisco Fed, it doesn't play a more outsized or major role. However, you could argue easily that for the wages and the continued increase that we'd seen, or at least right now, where wages are continuing to hold up, how consumers at the end of the day are trying to use the wages as best they can to battle back against inflation in many of their core purchases that they're making. Yeah, well, will we continue to see the same rate of inflation in uh, those wages? That is going to be a really key question. Uh, key question here. Um, we are also going to be closely watching any seasonal effects here. This is something that Goldman Sachs pointed out in their note previewing the numbers here that job growth tends to slow in May. Then you have teens come into the labor force in the summer months. So then you might see a rebound there. So that's something we're going to be watching. On the flip side of the equation from hiring, of course, is firing. And we got some very interesting data earlier in the week from Challenger Gray and Christmas. Their uh, cuts report, uh, their layoffs report, Report, basically is what they look at here. And we have seen um, basically a, an uptick in layoffs overall uh, this year, even though you've seen them uh, sort of uh, go up and down on a month over month basis. But really, the story is in technology in particular, where we have seen those cuts. Again, volatility on a month over month basis, but overall, on an absolute basis, year over year increases in the number of layoffs. This is what we know is happening, right? Anecdotally, yeah. right. we know it because we've been covering the companies that are cutting. <clears throat> That's just the overall number that we're looking at. And even as we think back to the data that we've already seen come through this week, especially on the form of private payrolls, you think about the wage increases that were seen there, both across the services and, and goods producing sector, but specifically within the industries that saw the most outsized jumps. Leisure and hospitality continues to come to mind. And then you also think kind of sector by sector going forward where that will continue to hold strong. But leisure and hospitality, a key area that continues to come back from the depths of uh, despair, if you want to call it that, over the course of the onset of the pandemic. And so with that, we'll see exactly where that number, that figure continues to add on to that larger overarching non-farm payrolls number. One of the really other interesting points that Goldman made in its preview note is mm. that leisure and hospitality tends to be a sector that relies heavily on lending, mm. on borrowing, I should say, and because of the perhaps credit crunch, perhaps because of the slowdown in lending on the part of banks in the wake of the regional bank crisis, we might see some maybe some initial signs of that happening in leisure and hospitality. I mean, as always, it's difficult to extrapolate the big picture from these very specific numbers, but that is something we'll be watching for. And then another thing we'll be watching for and trying to read the tea leaves on is AI and whether there is starting to be a little bit of an effect. Challenger Grain Christmas asked people if that was, asked companies if that was one of the reasons yeah. that they were cutting jobs. I think they were asked for the first time. Um, I saw Bloomberg's Tracy Alloway point this out and that 3,900 job losses were attributed to AI. That's really interesting. And especially given the commentary that we had from Yelena earlier this week, who mm -hmm. gave us a little bit more inclination around when you should expect this to show up as an input or any type of effect on the employment situation. And she expects that to not be the case for some time. However, a question now being put forward uh, to your point there a moment ago as well. Just taking a look at the futures coming into this report, we're holding strong up by about four tenths of a percent across the board for the Dow, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ futures. We'll see if we see any type of shift in that futures activity as we're just about an hour out from the start of trade. Yes, we will. And we'll see it, you know, whether the reaction is positive or negative, depending on the extrapolation for the Fed here. Third 
13 straight months now that these jobs numbers have beat the average economist estimate. We'll see if they do it again. Again, the estimate here for 195,000 jobs being added. So taking a look here, $339,000, uh, 39,000 jobs added wow. to the U.S. economy last month. Again, 339,000 is this initial lead here versus the 195,000 that was estimated. So the 14th straight, straight month now that we have seen job gains come in ahead of estimated. Of course, the revisions will be important as well. Unemployment rate going higher, however, to 3.7%. That's versus the 3.5% estimated and versus the 3.4% that was the read for the prior month. Average hourly earnings coming in in line with estimates on a month-over-month -month basis of three-tenths of 1%. Hourly earnings on a year-over-year -year basis rising just 4.3%. And I'm looking at the labor force participation rate as well to see if there was any uptick there. No, 62.6% .6 uh, bang on is what we continue to see for that labor force participation rate. But again, overall, 339,000, another, I mean, I think I can safely say blowout number yeah. uh, when we look at this jobs number. Um, and, and I think, A, yes, illustrates that the job market is still growing. B, illustrates it's still really hard to predict what's happening in this job market. I mean, this is something we're gonna talk about much later in, in the show, yeah. this idea of revisions here, because we have seen the last few jobs reports come out and beat big and then get revised lower right. in the final read. So just something to keep an eye on. Yeah, and some of the job gains, the largest job gains occurred in professional and business services, government, healthcare, construction, transportation, and warehousing and social assistance. Now, interesting there, what was left out, Legion Hospitality, uh, for perhaps one of the first reports in uh, multiple years at this point, was not the, it doesn't look like it was the biggest job gainer um, or adding the most to this headline number here. Um, that continued to trend up in May. That was up by about 48,000, but healthcare added 52,000 jobs in May. Uh, that's similar to the average monthly gain of about 50,000 over the past 12 months, though. Uh, but Leisure and Hospitality uh, getting knocked off of that top spot as that recovery continues. But at the same time, uh, the employment in that industry remains below its February 2020 level by about 349,000 jobs, comes out to about 2.1% there. Um, and then the other kind of major uh, figure con to continue to look at here is the revisions that you were mentioning uh, a moment ago. And the revisions that we saw, the change in total non-farm payroll employment for the month of March, that was actually revised up by 52,000. Oh, interesting. Yeah, from 165,000 to 217,000. Mm. Uh, and then the change for April, that was revised up by 41,000 from 253,000 to 294,000. Interesting. Now, they do revise them twice. There's a first revision and then another revision. So, but but nonetheless, that, yeah. that's quite interesting to see the gains get even more. So um, if you recall, mm -hmm. Yelena Shul Shulyetyeva of yes. BNP Paribas told us earlier in the week, uh, we asked her what would be the number yeah. that would get the Fed a little worried and maybe tip the scales towards a hike at the June 14th meeting. She said 250,000. The number is 339,000. So let's talk about the market's perception right. of whether that is the case. For that, we're going to bring in Jared Blickery. Jared, what are you seeing? Well, we saw a little bit of weakness initially, a spike down in futures, but really not a whole lot of action here. This is overnight. And uh, let me put some candlesticks on here so we can see any quick. There we go. We got that little downdraft there. Uh, a strong number means the Fed maybe has to get a little bit more aggressive. Not really seeing too much uh, heat, I would say, in the uh, hourly earnings. So that's not really not a principal uh, place of concern for the market right now. Let's also take a look. This is a NASDAQ. Let's take a look at the S&P 500 futures. And first of all, you'll notice all three of the majors are already in the green here. We've had a pretty good run for the week. S&P 500 has has been down. It's hard to see these little wicks here on the candle, but it's also been up. So a whole lot of nothing right there. And here's the Dow futures net up just a few points uh, since we got that drop of the information. And uh, here's the 10-year T-note. Uh, these are the futures. So these move inversely to the yield. So we actually have the 10-year yield going up a little bit. And let's see what's happening with the two-year. Two-year edging down, which means the yield just edging up a little bit. Not too much action there. We'll check out to see what's happening with gold. And I'm going to put some candlesticks back here. Uh, looks like a bit of a downdraft with a quick reaction. 
And uh, let's get a handle on copper. Not a lot there. And here's my favorite. I like to look. Like, I like to look at Bitcoin because uh, Bitcoin is very heavily levered to the Fed and its balance sheet. But we're not seeing much movement there mm. either. This is the summer, guys, and absent a huge, huge outlier, uh, most traders don't want to be at their desk. So <laughs> <laughs> we same, are. Same, Jared. Same. We are. But we, you know, there's important work to do. There's a big report yes. to discuss today. No the people's work. Jobs report. <laughs> yeah, Jared. Thanks so much for breaking that down. For more on this jobs data, we're joined by Greg Daco, who is the EY Chief Economist, and Emily Rowland, John Hancock Investment Management Co-Chief Investment Strategist. Great to have you both here with us on this morning. Uh, happy Jobs Day to you both, who I, I believe celebrate as well. Um, so, Greg, you're here in studio. Let's begin with you. I was kind of looking at your facial reactions as this number came out, much larger than expected on the headline print. Much larger than expected when it comes to the headline jobs print, but I think we have to dig a little bit deeper sure. into this report and look at some of the underlying indicators. On the jobs front, uh, there was still fairly low diffusion of job growth. 60% of private sector occupations saw job growth. That's on the lower end. Hours worked fell back 0.3%. That's below pre-pandemic levels now. Those are type of indicators that we have to pay attention to. The breadth and diffusion of the job market is as important as the headline print. We also saw that the unemployment rate rose. And if you look at the household survey, there was a massive drop, 300,000, 310,000 jobs lost on the household survey front and an increase of over 400,000 in the number of unemployed. These are also important data points that we have to keep in mind when we're looking at the breadth of the job market. So, so what do they tell us? They tell us that we have to be careful not to assume that this 300 plus thousand jobs headline print is as strong as it would otherwise indicate. That means that for the Fed that is looking at these numbers with a lot of care and a lot of attention, they have to really look at the broad set of numbers, not just focus on one headline print, which is indeed very strong and shows robustness in the labor market. But there are some cracks starting to appear in the foundation. And Emily, does that help then maybe explain why there doesn't seem to be that clear of a reaction in the market that says the Fed's going to go again? I mean, for example, I'm looking at the Fed Watch <laughs> tool from the CME, and it hasn't budged that much. Most uh, participants are still looking for a pause at the June meeting. Yeah, Julie, I've been refreshing the CME tool yeah. myself here <laughs> and seeing the same thing. And it might be to what Greg is speaking of. And I want to say real quick shout out to Greg. The only uh, disappointment I have being on the show with him today is I can't be on his Twitter feed getting analysis <laughs> on the jobs report. So thank you, Greg, so much for that. Uh, uh, your data is awesome. Um, but yeah, very muted response from the market. One thing that I'm watching is the two-year Treasury yield here just kind of yawning a little bit. We're just seeing that up about three basis points, uh, future sort of holding in steady with some gains here. So it seems like maybe it, it feels a little bit Goldilocks in terms of the reaction here. Of course, wage growth moderating a bit, I think is a, is a positive here in terms of the trajectory of inflation. And you know, some of the data over the past week has suggested that the labor market is tightening. Most importantly, the Q1 productivity report um, showed that unit labor costs were revised heavily down from about 5.8% to 3.8%. Um, that is a, a data point that economists watch really, really closely. We also saw qu the quit rate returning to 2019 levels. Um, that basically is suggesting we had a pocket there where a lot of people felt comfortable leaving their jobs and confident that they could make more money elsewhere. We're moving past that period of the great resignation in the U.S. So I think there's been a cacophony of data over the past week that does suggest that the labor market is slowly starting to show some cracks here. How does that show up in the number of consumers out there right now that are looking at the employment situation? Because we heard from the conference board that consumers that are looking at their ability to perhaps move from one job to another, get a job or, uh, or an increase, a salary bump as well, that factors into how they spend. And so how should consumers look at this employment situation? Well, I think it's a story of nuance. I think we have to understand that we are not in a period of retrenchment. We're in a period where we are starting to slow, see some signs of a slowing in the labor market. And that is the key backbone to consumer spending activity, both job growth and wage growth combined for income growth. And what we're seeing on that front is a softening of the trend. Nothing dramatic, nothing to panic about, but that, that, that slowdown in the trend on the income front is concerning because we still have elevated inflation and importantly for consumers, 
elevated prices. Mm -hmm. That means their buying power is reduced and they're increasingly going to push back against these prices. That's what we're starting to see in terms of consumer spending trends and the fundamentals in terms of households, in terms of their credit situation and their finances is also slowly deteriorating. We're seeing higher delinquencies, we're seeing higher debt servicing costs, and we're seeing an environment where excess savings are no longer that buffer that allow consumers to withstand any type of shock. So Emily, what does all of this mean for recession outlook and therefore investment outlook? You know, it's a, just a slow moving late cycle environment as, as Greg alluded to, you have this lagged impact of Fed tightening that is yet to impact the labor market. And you also see the services side of the economy booming. We also got PMI data earlier this week, which again suggested that manufacturing is very very well be in a recession, but the services side of the economy, the consumer is still spending because of course everybody still got a job. So we see us in this late cycle environment, which can be really tricky. Uh, the data are bouncing around all over the place. Um, again, we're seeing a, a sort of very different reads on the economy. We do think that this likely unfolds into a recession. We do think that the lagged impact of Fed tightening, especially such a large amount of tightening in a short amount of time, does eventually put pressure on corporate margins. And as companies deal with those margins and start to defend them, their biggest cost cutting is probably going to come on the labor side. So we do eventually see that. Um, uh, playing out here. But of course, we've got to be patient. We still want to have some offense as we're not there yet, but we want to be really mindful in portfolios of starting to sort of prepare for that environment, get a little bit more offensive, load up on higher quality stocks and embrace bonds. What, what does offense look like in a portfolio? Well, it means continuing to have some equities. Right now, we're favoring the U.S. over international equities. It's simply where you're going to find higher quality companies. These are ones with great balance sheets, good return on equity, lots of cash, a limited need to have to issue equity or debt in an environment where the cost of capital is going up. Uh, frankly, the poster child for quality is U.S. technology stocks, large cap growth stocks. And clearly, we've seen those catch a bid, we want to be mindful of the valuations there, given the run that we've seen in tech. It's responsible for about 80% of the market's returns so far here in 2023. So we want to look to other areas. We have um, classically defensive sectors in our portfolio, like utilities, um, where we're seeing utilities actually trading at a discount to the broad market. We haven't seen that in a long time. So we're uh, emphasizing that in portfolios and then some value in order to minimize our exposure to unprofitable growth at any price, zombie companies that have binged on zero uh, percent interest rates over the past couple of years. So it's really that combination of higher quality and more defensive equities and portfolios to get us through this. Greg, um, as we talk about the sort of the different areas that people are, are looking to put their money, I, I'm struck also by the sort of different, I know you look very macro, but there's also sort of the corporate inputs mm -hmm. into your models, I would imagine. And it's so confusing to me right now, because on the one hand, you have some retailers saying that consumers are trading down or they're not buying discretionary items. Then you have Lululemon, which is doing great, especially in China, but even in the US. And you have Nvidia saying that companies are spending money on AI chips. So what, like, the message is just so murky right now. It's extremely difficult to decipher the U.S. economy today. Uh, we talk to a lot of customers across a broad range of sectors at EY, and what we're hearing is a couple of things. First, we're hearing bifurcation when it comes to consumer spending trends. We're hearing that some individuals still have the means and the ability to spend despite high prices and despite this evidence of a bit, a bit of a slowdown in the labor market, we're seeing more difficulties at the lower end of the consumer spectrum. We're also hearing from companies that if they have the means to do so, they're thinking this is the right time to invest. So this is not the typical type of recession and pulling out the 09, 08, 09, or even the COVID recession playbook is not gonna work in this environment. You have to understand the unique features of this labor market. As Emily was highlighting, we have an environment where talent is extremely valuable. So you're not seeing the type of rapid retrenchment, massive layoffs across the board. You're seeing strategic hiring freeze decisions. You're seeing strategic layoffs instead. That makes it very difficult to decipher if you're looking at the old playbook when it comes to assessing the strength of the economy. And that's where the nuance comes in.
some of the sectors that were the strongest, uh, professional business services, in terms of adding jobs at least, professional business services, government, healthcare, still leisure and hospitality trending mm -hmm. higher, but zeroing in on some of the weaker areas, manufacturing, wholesale trade, retail trade, kind of pulling through some of what we had heard from the uh, ISM data that came out even yesterday and where the backlog of orders is sitting at a level that we haven't seen since the Great Recession, they noted within that report. So what does that signal for how long some of these sectors can continue to be challenged, especially on the employment situation front, given that they're not sure when that demand is going to reensue? I'll come back to a point that you made earlier about confidence. A lot of the soft data readings, the confidence readings, are fairly weak and in line with recessionary levels. If you look at some of the hard data, they're not showing that type of recessionary plunge in economic activity. I think that's really what you have to focus on. What are businesses doing? Are they retrenching or are they investing at a slower pace, spending at a slower pace? And I think the latter is really the true picture of the economy that we're seeing today. That means it's that much more difficult for the Fed to explore this environment and know how to react. Excessive data dependence and data point dependence, as we've seen from a few policymakers, is very risky. We know not that, the, that the status quo is essentially a pause or perhaps a skip at the June meeting, but there's going to be a lot of focus still on this backward looking data. We have a CPI report next week that will get a lot of attention. And with this headline print, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of chatter about the Fed potentially still thinking about raising rates in June, even though I don't think that's what they're going to do. Um, and Emily, just to go back for one second um, to something else you were talking about um, or that you have talked to us a lot about, um, and that's the Treasury market. Is it time for people to lighten up on their Treasury holdings at all? No, we would actually suggest the opposite. We think that there's a very attractive entry point right now for, for leaning into duration. Uh, we've seen, obviously, a, a massive backup in bond yields um, as a result of higher inflation and more aggressive Fed. And we think some of those things that have really been painful for bond investors actually go, go from being your sort of worst enemy to being your best friend. You know, maybe we see the Fed hike one more time. Right now, the bond market is pricing in a a pause in June, then a hike in July, but then cuts in September and December. So the, the bond market's telling you that the Fed is about to make a mistake, essentially. And what we do see going into recessions, of course, historically, is that the Fed cuts rates, and we see a pretty precipitous decline in 10-year Treasury yields. So we think that duration starts to be a tailwind uh, heading into the recession. And then on top of it, you're getting income, which is something that bonds haven't had. Uh, in a really long time. So we're looking opportunistically at this. We think being short duration um, is, is you know, not ideal at this stage in the game. We understand that it's very attractive looking at shorter term paper in terms of the yields, but there's significant reinvestment risk there as yields come down. So we think moving out the curve, really sort of emphasizing intermediate term bonds uh, here is, is the way to go uh, for the rest of this year. Um, good stuff from both of you. Thank you so much. It's always great to see you. Greg Dacko in the studio, EY Chief Economist, and Emily Rowland, John Hancock Investment Management, Co-Chief Investment Strategist. As you said, you know, you can go back to Twitter now and take a look at Greg. <laughs> Greg is the tweeting coming from <laughs> inside on, the Greg, house? Have you it. been tweeting while you've been Not on yet. with us? Not yet, okay. no, but I will do He's so. He's been focused. All right, thanks, <laughs> guys. You. Appreciate it. And just a quick recap of the numbers that we got. Uh, 339,000, that increase in jobs last month. Uh, that is better than the 195,000 estimated. But the unemployment rate ticking up here. And I'm seeing, by the way, it's, speaking of tweets, a tweet's from Adam Ozimak, who is a chief economist at innovate economy saying the gap between payroll and household he said self-employment decline by 369,000 so that's what's not captured in non-farm payrolls that would be captured in the household survey interesting note there average hourly earnings year over year going up by 4.3 percent coming up what are the most in demand jobs still we're going to speak with the ceo of recruiter.com next
The May jobs report came in hotter than expected, with the U.S. adding 339,000 jobs last month. But when it comes to job seekers, medical positions lead the way. 21% of recruiters saying those roles are most in demand. That's according to Recruiter.com. Evan Sohn, Recruiter.com CEO, is joining us now. Evan, it's good to see you here. I'm always curious um, if what you guys are seeing in your business sort of matches up with these big government reports. So... Talk to us about that. Is there a disconnect yeah, you know, or is it similar? It's a, it's a great question. I, I always look for trends more than anything else, mm -hmm. right? We're only getting a subset of recruiters and not all companies use recruiters uh, for jobs and not all jobs are found through recruiters. So when we start to see more recruiters focus on this past uh, month, more more recruiters were focused on areas that are paying like forty to $80,000 salary bands and 80 to 100. That actually would indicate that the less knowledge worker, if you will, you know, those, uh, and that in line with the medical jobs really being uh, number one that the recruiters were, were seeking. Uh, I, I thought those actually aligned really, really nicely with the actual job report. So I'm trying to hire a lot of workers in the medical space. Uh, I need recruiters to do that, to do that uh, and that's really gonna help. The other thing we really start to see were the remote, uh, where the in-person jobs uh, take a much, much higher priority uh, for the roles that the recruiters are working on. And clearly, when you're talking about in-person, uh, you're talking about uh, the medical, healthcare, those really are the in-person jobs, uh, leisure, leisure hospitality. Uh, I think number two is like sales and financial services. Uh, IT was number two. So some of those jobs also are coming back. The other thing that we looked at that was really interesting, sort of, uh, you know, the report came out uh, 23 minutes ago, so a little bit of retrospect, is there was nothing that was really outstanding in the actual report itself. And our index actually also showed that there was nothing really outstanding in the index. There was no big number of, oh my God, the backfill numbers went uh, high wire or uh, travel rolls went from 5% uh, to 22%. There was no big swings, which is actually, if you look at the report that came out at 830, uh, there was nothing that was really a really big swing. The only outlier was really medical and healthcare, which was the number one uh, industry segment that our folks were really prioritizing. Evan, even as you were discussing the roles and, and the job functions that are more likely to have to be in person or have to return to office or some type of workplace construct, is there any kind of recourse that those workers also have in order to try and make sure that, yeah, there's, there, there, there's competitiveness to try and get them back into those those facets of the employment yeah, so situation. It, it, that's a that's a great question. Um, the what we always look at what is the candidate priority, and what's their priority for why they want to leave, and what's their priority for taking a job. And uh, you know, in the pandemic, it was remote. It was quality of life. You know, I, look, I was shocked when it surpassed compensation. Compensation is now the number one reason that candidates are looking to leave. And this is as reported by recruiters. It's also the number one reason why they're taking a job. So it's very interesting that compensation, uh, thanks for uh, the info on the screen, uh, is really the number one reason. I'm, I'm looking to leave a job 
uh, because I I want more money and I'm looking to take a job because it's paying more money. Very, very much aligns uh, with that. And we actually saw uh, not too long ago, uh, employees looking to leave a company for money, but they're taking a job that provides them a better quality of life. So really interesting balances now. And I think that as the salaries are are now being normalized in this uh, away from hire people at whatever cost, uh, I, I think now uh, the candidates are still being more choosy, uh, which is why in the Jolt report you saw, okay, guess what? Now they're more open jobs uh, than they were in the prior month. Hiring is increasing. Uh, uh, the the quit rate is is slightly, and these are both slight numbers from the prior month, slightly decreasing quit rates higher than they were pre-pandemic uh, and sort of average of 2019 levels. Evan, how much, if at all, is uh, generative AI, large language models, changing what you do? Are people using it to write recruitment ads, for example? Uh, oh, so uh, we did a webinar yesterday on uh, titled uh, Work Harder, Not Smarter. Uh, work Smarter, Not Harder, sorry. <laughs> that would be the better uh, one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? <laughs> and it was a panel of really awesome uh, tech companies that are use that have AI tools that really help recruiters, both in-house, freelance, enterprise recruiters, do their jobs better leveraging AI. And it was amazing to watch. Everything from finding candidates through AI to uh, helping do some of the mundane uh, candidate pitching, writing up summaries of resumes and aligning them to job descriptions, to actually having transcripts during an interview process and having summary letters written all through AI and ChatGPT. And it was probably our most uh, successful webinar. Um, and so if that's an indication of how companies are gonna be leveraging AI, um, and we could talk about that uh, at nausea, but I think that you know you're, we've really seen many recruiters uh, lose their jobs throughout this process. You know, when you see the word layoff, the recruiters are first to go. When you see the word hiring freeze, the contract recruiters are cut or more recruiters are let go uh, in a hiring freeze. And so they have fewer recruiters trying to keep up and using these tools, chat mm. GPT tools, uh, we have our own tool called uh, CandidatePitch.com, uh, our own tool for uh, helping write up uh, summaries, et cetera, for uh, both job seekers and recruiters. These are tools that are going to help recruiters uh, do more with less. Yeah, it's going to be really remarkable how the job descriptions in the future change, too, as there's more of that kind of in tandem working between human intelligence and artificial intelligence. Evan Sohn, uh, we got to leave things there on the morning here as we uh, creep closer to the 9 a.m. hour. We appreciate the time this morning. We'd love to continue this conversation. Thanks so much. Have a great day now. Absolutely. It's Evan Sohn, Recruiter.com CEO, joining us. Let's recap those jobs numbers. We saw 339,000 jobs added during the month of May. Unemployment, that ticked higher. That rate now sitting at 3.7% versus the expectation of 3.5% and average hourly wages year over year. Those moved higher by about 4.3%. Coming up, Lululemon is surging on the back of its report. We'll explain why next.
Hello again and happy Jobs Friday. It is 9 a.m. Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman with Brad Smith. And here are three things you need to know this morning. May payrolls coming in hotter than expected at 339,000, far exceeding expectations and leading to more questions over the Fed's move at this month's policy meeting. The data-dependent FOMC will be looking at the resilience of the labor market amid a swirl of economic headwinds. This week's data continues to reinforce the notion of a two-speed economy. Private payrolls also far exceeded expectations, while ISM data showed a seventh month of shrinking factory activity. Investors can at least take a calamitous default off the table after the Senate passed the U.S. debt ceiling bill. The vote survived a revolt from senators concerned the package would underfund the Pentagon and now heads to President Biden. The removal of that obstacle puts the market's focus squarely back on monetary policy. Yesterday, we saw bets flip from largely expecting a quarter point hike to strongly expecting the FOMC to hold fire. And that remains the case pretty much this morning. Inflation data hits the day the FOMC meets, making June 13th and 14th key dates on the calendar. And Lululemon shares surging after raising guidance on strong sales and a robust international performance. No sign of a discretionary spending slowdown here. The business sees affluent customers continuing to spend on yoga pants and belt bags. And it's also seeing that in the world's second biggest economy. Revenue in China jumping almost 80% from a year earlier. Back then, of course, it was still in COVID lockdown mode, so there was a stark comparison here. The outlook from Lululemon is solid. The athleisure retailer now expects second quarter sales growth of around 15%. So the May jobs reports came in hotter than expected. Let's get reaction from Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schoenberger. Jennifer. Good morning, Brad. Ten consecutive rate hikes, not enough to knock down the job market, yet that number, as you mentioned, continuing to surprise to the upside, blowing out. And that, though, not enough to convince investors that the Fed is going to pull the trigger and hike rates again at the June meeting in less than two weeks' time. Take a look at the Fed funds futures this morning. They have been bobbing around wildly. We saw as low as a 60-40% chance of a pause, uh, as high as better than 70%. Uh, Now it's bobbing around 65% chance that we will see a pause. Coming into this number, Fed officials have been very divided about what to do. Of course, they're going to be looking closely at this number. Though this week we heard from two key officials, uh, Fed Governor Philip Jefferson, as well as Patrick Harker at the Philadelphia Fed, who both hinted that the Fed should pause or skip the next meeting before perhaps raising rates again later this year to take a step back and assess. Uh, Chair Powell for himself as well as New York Fed's uh, Williams have both said they're or have hinted that they're both open to either option. But we do have four voting members who have strongly signaled in the past couple of weeks that a rate hike would be necessary given the stronger than expected data that inflation has been stubborn. Those members, including Fed Governor Bowman, Lori Logan of the Dallas Fed, uh, Neil Kashkari from Minneapolis, and Fed Governor Waller. Uh, of course, many Fed officials believe that a strong job market is feeding inflation higher. We're going to get another read on inflation on the first day of the Fed's meeting uh, when we get that CPI number out on June 13th. We So that is going to be the definitive uh, deciding factor on whether the Fed will pause or continue raising in June. We have not uh, heard yet from uh, President Biden on this report, but I will get a White House reaction when I speak with Heather Boucher, a member of the president's economic uh, council uh, at about 1015 this morning. Back to you. Looking forward to that always. Always interesting to hear from Heather. Thanks so much, Jennifer Schomburger. So the May jobs report coming in hotter than expected, but does it move the needle for the Fed? Joining us now, Brian Jacobson, Annex Wealth Management Chief Economist and Strategist, and Max Kettner, HSBC Chief Multi-Asset Strategist. Hotter than expected on the headline, although as we were discussing earlier with EY's Greg Daco, if you look at the other numbers, it's perhaps not as strong as it first appears, particularly, of course, that unemployment rate taking up to 3.7%. Max, let's bring you in first on this. Uh, what's sort of your first read here and the implications for the Fed? Look, I think that the first read is that things are fine, right? Things are still uh, defying the doom and gloom that, that a lot of people have thought would occur uh, perhaps six, seven months ago, right? It is 
I think what we're still seeing is that people are fretting about rate hikes and fretting about when the tightening is finally going to be felt in the in the economy more broadly. And the reality is, of course, right, that we since the beginning of the fourth quarter and the end of the third quarter, you know, equity volatility is down, FX volatility is down, rates volatility is down, yields are down, equities are up, spreads are tighter, the dollar is weaker. So frankly, in the last seven, eight months, what we've really seen, particularly in financial markets, is easing across the board and financial conditions, particularly the delta in financial conditions, has become so much more favorable and we're still you know we're still seeing those effects in the broader economy that that just isn't managing to to sort of slow things down sufficiently and that is you know that's manifesting itself i think in those jobs reports but also broadly in in some other economic data in the u.s brian what about you where do you stand uh, is the headline print here just just window dressing yeah, I think that they actually have to look at the entire report. So with the establishment survey where we get the 339,000 numbers from, that was very strong. Although if you look at the diffusion indices, so it shows where are those job gains, manufacturing is still contracting. Right. So we've had a manufacturing recession. Maybe we can find some stability there. So it's really been mostly in services. Now, if you look at the household survey, where we get the unemployment rate from, that actually showed a decline of 310,000 for employment. Okay, so you have a massive divergence between what employers are saying with payrolls and households are saying for that household survey. Now, how do you square this circle? We think the best way to think about it is when it comes to trying to contemplate what the Fed might do, wages aren't really re-accelerating here. And that's probably one of the most important data points in the employment situation report. It's not necessarily the payrolls number, but it's the wage gains. 0.3% month on month is good, but it's not fast enough to probably change the opinions of those people who are looking for a pause or a skip. So on that point, I, I heard a word earlier from one of our earlier guests that I hadn't heard in a while, and that word is Goldilocks, right? Which is kind of the picture that Brian is painting here. Max, um, are we in a, a good environment for stocks here for that reason, where maybe it's a not too hot, not too cold situation? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. 100%. I think, uh, you know, if if you were to uh, invent some kind of data environment, it would be exactly this one, right, where some data are a bit worse than expected, some data are a bit uh, better than expected. I would sort of point to, uh, in the US in particular, to the regional Fed surveys, right? If you want to be really, really properly bearish, you point out to one of, you point out you know, one or two of those regional Fed surveys that every other month, you know, uh, uh, surprise massively to the downside. And every other month, there's a couple of them that actually surprise massively to the upside. The net effect is that things are holding up. They're ticking along. It's not great. It's not sh shooting the lights out, but it's not as awful as people are making it either. And let's remember that consensus has just been shifting forward its expectations for a recession, right? In the US, what we're no longer really seeing is that consensus is expecting uh, any sort of recovery in the second half. If anything, consensus is now squarely expecting that recession to occur in the second half. And against such pretty gloomy expectations, you know, it's going to be really, really difficult to massively surprise to the downside and to see equities go down, I don't know, to the magnitude of 10 to 20%. I want to leave this target Fed rate uh, probability up on the screen because it actually has has just changed here uh, a little bit more. That's where it was at just after, or at, at least a, as of 9 a.m. As of 9.09, I'm seeing it updated and sitting at about 34%. So it's, it's budged higher a little bit, not tremendously, Brian, but if there's anything that we hear from some of the larger bulls, or not bulls, but hawks out there in, in Fed speak, some of them non-voting members, but they still could steer at least or put on the table um, something for the conversation to move in a different direction. Well, that's very true. In the FOMC meeting, everybody gets to participate whether they're a voting member or not. But ultimately, what matters is who are the voters. And mm -hmm. I believe that if you look at the balance of individuals who are the voters, uh, it's they're in the camp of let's see how things shake out. We've done a lot already. So here at Annex on our investment committee, when we discuss this on a very regular basis, we think that even if the market is pricing in like a 33 percent that the Fed might hike to us, we would say that they're probably not going to hike. We would take the under on that as 
as far as with the probability. That doesn't mean the Fed is done. They're going to try to be data dependent. But one thing to put into perspective is that if we were to look at the pre-COVID trend for payrolls, we are actually still about 4.2 million jobs short of where we should be. You know, payrolls have grown about 2% from the uh, beginning of COVID uh, before you saw the massive job losses. Well, the real GDP is up over 5%. So you can have this really bizarre situation where even if it is a recession, it can be a rather job full recession. Interesting. Um, I want to turn a little bit more to the markets here, guys, and, and what we're not only what we're seeing now, but what we could see. Our Jared Blickery in the takeaway in this morning's morning brief talked about the sort of delicacy of the market perhaps right now, because maybe things feel Goldilocksy, because we're going into the quiet summer period. The summer period, particularly August, is when we tend to get some big swings in the market, although I also remember Brexit and its June consternation that that caused. Um, what are any risks that you two are watching for on the horizon? Now the debt ceiling's done, got another jobs report, Fed's coming. Um, Max, I'll start with you. What's next that you're sort of bracing for? Yeah, look, I think uh, what we are seeing still now is uh, in, in our sort of baseline, right, where well, we've been pretty constructive, we've been pretty pretty bullish and, and advocating for this risk on some stance since the start of the year. And what we're really still seeing is our top-down leading indicators, they're going up, our earnings indicators, they're going up. One of the next couple of things that I want to see is really earnings revisions, particularly in the US, really starting to stabilize and really pick up a bit, right? We've seen that after the end of the Q1 reporting season. And I would suggest, you know, the weaker dollar compared to last year, uh, positive activity surprises, you know, what we've heard from company management in the Q1 earnings calls, all that suggests that earnings revisions should be picking up. And that is then supportive for equity performance. Now, in terms of in terms of the downside risks, I think perhaps one of them that, that is a bit underappreciated is, of course, liquidity risks, right? Is the risk perhaps that, um, you know, the relief of uh, uh, the debt ceiling deal makes way for a bit of that debt deluge that we could be facing around T-bill issuance and, and where and how that's going to be financed. And lastly, I would say, you know, when we look particularly at our sentiment indicators, so we track a range, almost 20 different sentiment and positioning indicators across systematic and discretionary positioning and ETF markets and options. And we haven't seen that aggregate sentiment index of ours in outright bullish territory since November 2021. Last week, so as of last Friday, this is the first time it's really hit, just about, but really just hit the first time this outright bullish territory. So we are maybe getting a little bit stretched here, starting to get a bit stretched, and we are really starting to doubt for the first time in six months uh, our, our risk on stance here. Huh, interesting. Brian, what about you? Yeah, so here at Annex, the way that we're positioning portfolios, we've been almost like skeptical bulls, right? It's one of those things where you know that there are a lot of risks, but you still think that there are good opportunities because let's face it, we actually had an earnings recession already. That happened. S&P 500 earnings are off about 8% from their 2021 highs. We've gone through a recession uh, on the earnings front. Does it really matter if we go through one uh, when it comes to the real economy, especially with investors, they care more about the fundamentals. I think one of the bigger risks here is that people, right when they sort of just accept that the top five companies in the S&P 500 are going to continue to lead the way, all of a sudden it's going to change, right? Which is why we are really urging people to stay diversified, stay focused on those long-term goals. If you look at the long history, let's say the S&P 500 equally weighted index versus the market cap weighted one, during most periods of time, long periods of time, it's the equally weighted one that tends to outperform. It's only during the really tough, challenging economic environments in which you get this massive concentration, growth is so scarce, people pay up for that. Well, now all of a sudden, maybe that can flip back more towards towards an equally weighted, better diversified portfolio. Brian Jacobson and Max Kettner, please stay with us. We've got much more to discuss here this morning. We do want to switch gears, though, and we got to talk about a stock that is moving off of its earnings. Lululemon surging in pre-market trade, and it's an international growth story here. Revenue in China surged almost 80 percent on the year. This time last year was a very different story in the nation, of course, there with COVID zero policies still in place. However, 
take a look at the shares pre-market. They're up 16%, and some of the key areas, China included, but then additionally, if you were to look through what they, or listen into what they talked about over the course of the earnings report, there were a few things that I was hoping they would say more about. Of course, this is a company that has done so well in changing the way that athleisure companies have gone more direct to consumer, but they're also trying to enhance the product mix that they do have. Footwear, one of those categories that I looked into a little bit more, really only had kind of five mentions um, word basis on the call. But I think that strategy is what investors want to hear more about going forward as well, considering that it can be very difficult to take on market share. But if they are able to do so successfully, um, whether that be brick and mortar or whether that be online sales, I think that's where investors can perhaps hang their hat on some of that future growth coming through at Lululemon. Uh, and then Additionally, it's just a regional story as well that we witnessed in the most recent quarter. But going forward, what does the U.S. consumer, an area where Lululemon has really hung its hat for so long, mm -hmm. what does that consumer hold uh, given some of the discretionary spending that we've seen waver, moderate, or even dry up in some income brackets, uh, as we had heard from other retailers over the course of this earnings season? It's not happening with them. I mean, the China sales were und undeniably strong, up sure. 79%. Yep. They have 101 stores now. now. They're planning to open more. Mm -hmm. uh, this year of those China stores as well. They're opening a bunch of international stores, and they said most of them are going to be in China. I think 30 to 35 international stores is what they're talking about here. But guess what? The U.S. numbers weren't bad, right? Yeah. The company said comp stores were up 16% in their stores, 18% in the e-commerce business. North America overall was up 17%. This struck me as well. Women's sales up 22%. Male sa men's sales up 17%. Accessories yeah. up 67%. So it's belt now, bags. I, I, I assume it's the belt bags, right? <laughs> I, um, I don't know if footwear falls into the accessory category. I would think so, um, right? And that's a mm. higher ticket accessory item than a belt bag, for example. Yeah. Um, they sell lots of other stuff. I have a Lululemon backpack. I got a Lululemon yoga mat. Hey. So, you know, there are those other things that there's... But that that's striking to me that the, the growth in particular in the accessories, I thought was quite interesting. So obviously the market greeting all of this very enthusiastically and emphasizing the um, the China sales in particular. They've got a really solid flip-flop. I'll say that anecdotally. Oh, I tried that I out. I don't know anything about I've, that. I've tried it on in multiple stores. I still haven't purchased just yet. I've been looking for my size. However, the men's flip-flop uh, feels very good. I, I just wish that we'd see more of the um, footwear category start to move forward. Perhaps we will uh, over at Lulu. Maybe. Well, Maybe. One more yeah. quick, quick note here uh, is what we saw in inventory. Inventory still was higher by, I think, something like 20, uh, 24% mm year over year, which is a slowdown in the inventory increase, but they still talked a little bit about the promotions that are still happening. Um, so that's just something to keep an eye on as we go forward. The so-called we made too much category is uh, Lululemon's euphemism it's for my favorite rack. sale. Yeah. Of, of course. And it looks like they do break out footwear separately, ah, okay. a, aside from accessories. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that wasn't the same... Uh, not same, same, same increase. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's focus in on the China uh, portion of this for a moment because Lululemon bucking a difficult backdrop for retailers thanks in part to those strong numbers out of China. The data out of that economy has been mixed to say the least. Let's get back to Brian Jacobson, Annex Wealth Management Chief Economist and Strategist, and Max Kettner, HSBC Chief Multi-Asset Strategist. I hope both of you are wearing Lululemon on your lower halves. We'll never know, but um, but let's talk about let's talk about China for a moment and how this relates to China. It's surprising to see these numbers. Yes, you've got the year-over-year -year comparison when things were more shut down, but still, it's quite interesting to see this sort of reflection of what's going on here. Brian, I'll start with you here. How are you thinking about the China story at this point? Yeah, you know, some of the data lately has been somewhat disappointing, but I think it just depends upon how enthusiastic you were about what 2023 would look like. We were anticipating that we'd see about 5% GDP growth, which is in line with what the government basically told people that it should be. And it seems like that's pretty consistent with the story. Now, we have seen some of that weakness in manufacturing. Um, if you look at the services index, that's been good. 
yes, it is weakening a little bit. But so far, we think that it's actually, you know, the China reopening story, it wasn't bound to be like the reopening in the United States. We thought that it was going to be more almost like this kind of slow boil where things begin to Im improve as opposed to just like this raging fire of demand that suddenly was unleashed. So we're actually still pretty optimistic about this recovery continuing. It's just that it's not going to be as uh, dramatic or as sudden. Now, it was encouraging to hear a company like Lululemon talk about how what things look like in China, because everybody, I think, has been thinking things are slowing too quickly. But maybe there's still a lot of pent up demand there, especially for U.S producers of global brands. We think that this is actually one of our themes that we like. U.S. companies can really benefit from the either asynchronous slowdown that might happen, or our base case is more this asynchronous recovery. Max, do you believe that there's any type of carryover then for other athletic apparel and footwear companies. I'm looking at Nike shares this morning pre-market. They're up by about three and a quarter percent. So is what's true for Lululemon in uh, an international market also true for some of the same players within that industry? Yeah, I think so, right? Uh, if we look at consumer discretionary more broadly and outside of the, the more techie and growth uh, sensitive names and the consumer discretionary categories, in fact, when we look at some of our analysis, right, that we do around earnings calls and around earnings call sentiment, particularly with regard to the guidance of those consumer discretionary uh, companies, then really what we're seeing is that particularly after the Q1 reporting season, guidance of these consumer discretionary companies has been as strong as it has been for three years, right? So just before COVID. So in, in reality, really, I think consumer demand still remains pretty healthy, right? Nominal growth, which at the end of the day for us as investors is the most important, right? We don't really care whether real GDP growth will be, you know, going up by 0 0.2 or down by 0 0.2, as long as nominal growth is on pretty healthy levels. And that is supporting nominal earnings, uh, you know, quite well. That actually is, is pretty good. And I think that particularly applies uh, to consumers as well. And perhaps one word on China, I would agree with what Brian is saying. We look at the, you know, the consensus forecasts um, for this year for GDP. Then when you look at the major global economies, the Eurozone, the US, then what we've seen has been very tepid upgrades to growth forecasts, right, to those gr consensus growth forecasts. All that's really been happening is that consensus has dropped the full year recession uh, calls. But when we look at China, right, people have become much more optimistic and really much more sort of enthusiastic about the near term growth rebound. So whilst, you know, the story isn't wrong, perhaps the market and consensus has become a little bit ahead of themselves. Right. And then and now we're starting to see a bit more reality. But I would say, you know, particularly in China, the domestic con consumption story still remains very much intact. And so just just briefly from both of you, buy Chinese stocks here. We had, uh, I think, some strategists cut their uh, recommendations on it this morning. Brian, you first. Yeah, the way that we're looking at it at Annex is we prefer to take a more diversified approach to investing in emerging markets, maybe think more about the longer term themes about the reshoring, who's going to be the beneficiaries there. It could be companies in India, Vietnam, Mexico, other places outside of China. But uh, we do still uh, have a positive outlook on the Chinese consumer. So it really does depend upon the sector and the specific companies. And Max? Yeah, I think probably uh, broadly speaking, if we look at Chinese indices, they're too geared still towards the old economies, towards manufacturing. So it's much more a stock pickers market, right? It's what Brian was saying. The longer term things, particularly around the Chinese consumer, really looking at some of those uh, sectors and in particularly uh, stocks that benefit from that the most. And otherwise, you know, we're seeing a bit more perhaps uh, uh, attractive, um, you know, attractive opportunities elsewhere in places like Mexico and LATAM, in places like EMEA and the GCC, for example, but perhaps there's a bit better opportunities tactically right now from a broader market index perspective. All right, Brian and Max, please stay with us for a hot second here as we tee up our next conversation. Uh, and artificial intelligence, we got to talk about that because it's a day that ends in Y and artificial intelligence has continued <laughs> its takeover with revenue from generative AI now estimated to reach 1.3 
$1.5 trillion by 2032. That's according to Bloomberg. Let's bring back in Max Kettner, HSBC, Chief Multi-Asset Strategist. Plus, we've got Brian Jacobson, who is the Annex Wealth Management Chief Economist and Strategist. Okay, so gentlemen, as we think about what generative AI has meant for companies repositioning, how they've adjusted their own workforce in some cases, and where they've put massive hordes of capital towards seeing that this can be a, a revenue generator and a profit generator for them in the future. When should that be a reality? When, when is kind of the time frame that you even think about, all right, we better see this pay off? Brian, I'll start with you. I would say that people are maybe getting a little too optimistic about how soon you could see the payoffs to it. If you remember back 1987, Robert Solow once said that the computer age was everywhere except for in the productivity statistics, and computers had been around for decades. Right Now, granted, he just had to wait about five to ten years before it showed up. This is AI is probably going to play out over a faster time period, so we don't have to wait decades, but it is likely to be playing out over the course of years. I'm just a little concerned some companies are going to jump on the AI hype way in here and talk about what their AI strategy is, even if it is probably completely irrelevant, there's a risk of over-investing in it for many companies. And um, Max, when you think about it, I know you're, you're sort of more macro here as well, but you know, is it going to trickle into everything? I mean, to, to be perfectly honest, the way our jobs have changed is already dramatic, right? In, in research and in the analysis function, I remember, you know, when I started this, uh, people were talking about, oh, have you seen what Company X is saying? And therefore, I'm making, you know, predictions of the whole economy on this sample size of one. And, you know, anyone who's, who's ever run a regression in Excel on a sample size of one will know the results of that. Um, and, you know, nowadays, I just I have a team of data science and data scientists around me, and I ask them, you know, what uh, ten thousands of companies are doing, and in millions of sentences and earnings calls, and you get that, and you, you know, you can really leverage that for your own analysis already, uh, and that's already leveraging quite quite good results. Now, I would agree with what Brian is saying. There is perhaps a little bit too much excitement in the near term. And I think perhaps one of the last ones and the latest ones um, around these times that we've seen was perhaps something like China Internet in 2019, where the theme is such, right, the longer term theme is definitely still intact and has been intact since then. But valuations just becoming a little bit ahead of themselves, you know, the stocks perhaps rallying a bit too much, and perhaps also, you know, companies going into that theme where it's not as relevant as we think, and where perhaps that is actually, uh, uh, you know, running the risk of diversifying away from some of those core businesses where they really shouldn't be doing that. So it's really perhaps the, the hype of it in the last couple of weeks and months becoming a little bit too much in terms of the pricing, in terms of the valuations. But the story as such, I think, is, is really something that will be playing out over the next five to 10 years. We're taking a look at some of the big tech companies that have mentioned AI on their call. We should note that Apple didn't do so voluntarily. They got asked about it, and then Tim Cook responded. But for the companies that have been vocal about it, one notably is not on that screen. It's NVIDIA. And they have clearly run away with the narrative around AI right now, Brian and Max. And Max, kind of getting back to what you were mentioning a moment ago, even if valuations do seem ahead of themselves right now, putting AI into the mix for some of these companies, I wonder on the other side, if there is a pillar within AI, whether it's the applications, whether it's the, the language learning models, or whether it's the, the chips at the basis of that, where investors could still feel comfortable with the likelihood that they'll see some type of return on a nearer term because of the demand for generative AI products. Yeah, look, well, I, I think definitely. on the chip side of things. Max, I'll go to you first look, on that. Sorry, sorry. Look, on the chip side of things, I think uh, the problem with, with the chip cycle, of course, is that it's not just hinging and not just dependent on the AI side of things, but it's also dependent really on the global cycle. Right? Let's remember that the chip cycle is a highly, highly cyclical business. Remember, for example, two years ago, we were talking about this massive shortage of chips for car manufacturers, for you know the goods sector overall. So uh, there, I would be careful with just really declaring that an AI, an AI theme, but really also a bit more of a, a cyclical, a global cyclical uh, uh, theme, really. Whereas you know some of the the natural language processing models, you know those sorts of things, uh, that, those are probably the purer AI plays. That if people want to really be exposed purely to the AI theme, that is probably the one. 
um, where it's a bit more attractive. Whereas if you go towards the chip cycle, be aware that it's not just AI, but you're going to be also quite exposed to the clo global cycle, to, to, so to some sort of beta, uh, uh, broader beta themes as well, and not just to the pure AI theme. And Brian? Yeah, Max said it perfectly. I think, yeah, the chip industry, if you think about semiconductors, how do people typically perceive it is that it was almost like a low margin, very cyclical area. How, to what extent, how quickly will this become commoditized? Right. I think that's a key thing for people to think about is not just what do things look like now, what are uh, the executives saying, but what are the competitive dynamics? We're actually much more interested in some of the more like ancillary plays on this about the companies that are going to be able to utilize the technology, not necessarily those who are building the chips that are going to power it. You can even think about, let's say, data centers from a REITs perspective, uh, or if you kind of want to think about energy, how is this all going to be powered? There's all sorts of sort of knock-on effects and possible beneficiaries that I think if you think in terms of like second order, third order, uh, thinking to really uncover what are the future opportunities here. Guys, thanks so much for spending some time with us this morning. Brian Jacobson, Annex Wealth Management Chief Economist and strategist Max Kettner actually is going to stick around for a little bit longer. Brian, thank you. Have a great weekend. Coming up, shares of Broadcommerce slipping slightly in the pre-market. We're going to give you that report and give you more movers. Just have the opening bell, so we'll also give you a check on what's going on in markets next. Welcome back, everyone. Let's take a look at some of the major average activity here as we have just started off this Friday trading session here 
on the day and taking a look at the Dow Jones, uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, excuse me, it's up fractionally by about eight tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite, you're seeing that higher by about one percent early in trade here. And then additionally for the S&P 500, that's up by about nine tenths of a percent. I want to take a look at some of those sectors within the S&P 500, as we always do to kick off the trading activity. We've got that loaded up for you here. Eleven S&P 500 sectors. We'll put that on an intraday move for you just so it Nobody gets shocked at home there. We've got 11 out of, we got 10 out of 11 uh, sectors in positive territory here out of the gate this morning. Utilities is pulling up the caboose, the lone laggard, if you will. It's down by about half a percent. But leading the pack, yeah, you got a lot of green on the screen. Consumer discretionary up by about 1.7 percent. But materials is actually leading the way right now by a smidge. It's up by 1.8 percent. Let's also take a look at the NASDAQ composite because I want to direct our attention to a company in Netflix as long as I can find it somewhere on this screen. Perhaps I'll just get on over to some of the streaming names. That'll get us a little bit closer. But as we're taking a look at the NASDAQ 100, you can see very clearly that you've got a lot more green than you do red here out of the gate this morning. And why do I want to look at streaming here this morning? I want to check in on shares of Netflix. This is uh, still higher, holding on to gains of about six tenths of a percent. That after the shareholders pushed back on an executive compensation plan that was put to a vote here. And so so with that, we're seeing shares hold up for Netflix as of right now. That one of the bigger stories, of course, there are a myriad of stories that surround the streaming environment and landscape right now, whether that be on content, whether that be on executive compensation or subscriber numbers, so forth. But as of right now, many of the streaming players right now in positive territory. However, from Netflix, that particular move from the investors and from the shareholders, it comes at a time where there's still this ongoing battle with the writers alliance uh, and so that writers strike specifically also in focus for streaming over the past couple of weeks here as well Julie yeah I've been seeing some strikers around town so uh, ah. it's interesting that as that goes on um, let us talk overseas a little bit here Japan led global equities higher in May as US lawmakers battled over the debt ceiling we were seeing some reforms happening in corporate Japan let's take a look at the bigger picture and what we can expect for the rest of the summer with Max Kettner HSBC chief multi-asset strategist Max, I wrote earlier in the week about the strength we've been seeing in Japan and the sort of debate now over, you know, in the past, we've seen foreign investors come into Japan and then they sort of leave again. Um, and we talked to a couple of folks this week who said, well, maybe this time is different. They're making some fundamental reforms in improving return on equity over there. What's your view on Japan? Yeah, look, Japan on, on the equity side were just neutral, really, because the problem is, I guess, um, I don't think, you know, th this time is different. Uh, I think always the, the sort of famous last words, so I'm always c cautious on, on using them. But really, the point is about Japanese equities. Why have they rallied so much since the start of the year? Well, quite simply, because people were really much more afraid of the Bank of Japan changing course much more dramatically much earlier. And that is what's not happening at the moment. So as, as a result, right, we've seen obviously this dollar weakness since the start of the year, or since Q4 2022. But at the same time, we've seen dollar strength against the Japanese yen, right? So the Japanese yen, when we look at that, has, has been uh, depreciating really quite dramatically over the last uh, couple of months, as really there is isn't really any dramatic change in the Bank of Japan policy in sight anytime soon. And that, of course, supports some of that earnings picture in Japan, as Japan still has a huge, huge share of foreign revenue exposure. So it's really much more, I think, a Bank of Japan and FX story that temporarily now really supports the Japanese equity market. I would be, however, ever careful because um, after, you know, after this strong rally now and after this easing of domestic, not only global, but also domestic financial conditions, it only needs a handful of, you know, maybe one or two uh, above consensus inflation prints in Japan. And this whole story, this whole, you know, concern around will the Bank of Japan widen or maybe even abandon its yield curve control and all that could lead to a stronger yen ultimately. And that would then weigh again on Japanese earnings. And so with that in mind, I mean, much of the focus now, even as we discuss Japan and even as we discuss um, kind of the Asia Pacific equation right now, what does that mean for some of the emerging markets that some investors would have looked at in the past? 
Yeah, I think, you know, Japan has obviously been one of those, uh, uh, you know, one of those countries that's been benefiting perhaps from some of the money going out of China and out of the Chinese equity markets as those indices simply weren't really the right ones to capture this kind of domestic and consumption driven uh, recovery that we're seeing in China right now. So that also has perhaps a bit of a, an expiry date. But I would say, you know, other other equity markets in Asia, if we look, for, for example, about ASEAN and the reopening, think about, you know, tourist arrivals uh, really, really sky high in large parts of ASEAN um, other markets as well, like Korea, that are very, you know, very well balanced between their value and growth components. That is quite a quite a positive for um, some markets like that as well. And India as well. Right. India's got this sort of longer term thematic story, that longer term convergence story still. Of course, it's expensive, but let's remember India has always been uh, on, on the expensive side of things in the last, uh, really in the better uh, part of the last 10 years. Um, so, but, but the convergence story still is, is, is very much alive there. So there are really pockets outside of China and outside of Japan that are really still working. ASEAN, you know, uh, uh, Korea, uh, India, all of those are still quite attractive. All right. Max Kedner. HSBC Chief Multi-Asset Strategist. Max, thanks so much for taking the time here with us today. I appreciate it. All right, let's talk about some other movers now. Broadcom stock moving higher this morning after faltering in the pre-market. Uh, let's take a check on the shares here to see how they're going, up about 2%. Uh, the company touting the potential to double its AI sales this year. The chipmaker also beat on its top and bottom line for its second fiscal quarter, but mentioned that softening chip demand is causing some inventory glut. And initially, the shares were down because investors seemed to be focusing more on the current slowing sales growth rather than on the potential increase in sales related to AI. Even as Hocktan, the CEO, said that you know, eventually 25% of their sales could be linked to AI. It just goes to show how much of not just a demand that you need to show in this at least earnings season where we've seen record number of mentions among S&P 500 companies of artificial intelligence, not just the talks of demand, but also a timeline as to when you can monetize what the margins might look like on some of those investments and even the level of investment. I think back to even uh, meta platforms, they said, yeah, it's a huge opportunity for themselves, but they can't disclose. They don't even know how much they're going to be spending on it. So for investors that are looking for that return on investment or return on capital spent from some of these companies, it, it comes from these companies also disclosing how much they're going to be spending on it, where resources, both on the capital front, on the human resources side, that still needs to move that technology forward, how that's going to be allocated. And so I think that still is, despite all the mentions we saw this earnings season, still murky, uh, even in many of the technology companies that have the best play at seeing some type of artificial intelligence benefit to their business. Yeah, well... We need the proof. We need proof. Yeah. Yeah. Also, let's talk about Dell stock this morning. Dell stock rising today. The tech company had a pretty strong first quarter, beating revenue and earnings expectations, plus seeing reductions in costs. But weak PC demand and macroeconomic concerns casting a shadow. Shares are actually holding on to gains right now by about 2.6 percent um, as we've continued to track the Austin-based company here this morning. Yeah, the company's sales outlook here, it looks like it's as much as $21.2 billion, which is kind of, that's the higher end of their estimate. That's kind of in line with what analysts had been predicting. So just sort of meh, continued meh, <laughs> yeah. I guess, is what you've got here. The COO saying we executed well against a challenging uh, economic backdrop. So this is kind of where we're at here with this. We have heard some murmurings from the likes of HP and others that right. maybe the second half of the year was going to improve or at least not get worse. And so that's kind of percolating out there too. But, you know, that's not yet sort of reflected in, in the numbers that we're seeing. Yeah, really uncertain as to when that next super cycle among mm -hmm. the PC demand would be. Also, what type of chips and the, the chip companies would hope that um, they are able to submit some successful bids into ensuring that their chips are within that. Uh, perhaps more could hope for that than Intel. Um, but as you think about all of the different production that could ensue on the back of another super cycle, it would really still need to depend upon what the business purchasing environment is like for the number of end users that they would have to purchase um, as they kind of account for the lion's share 
of that revenue that these companies could see, or at least the purchase and volume. Uh, but then additionally, what the consumer discretionary environment looks like. I mean, I haven't changed my laptop since, my goodness, uh, two administrations ago, I feel like. So, wow. yeah, I'm doing pretty well on my front. Oh, that's, that's all I got. That's, yeah, yeah I, haven't, I haven't changed mine out either. <laughs> so there you go. It's, it's moving along here. Same, same way we are. MongoDB shares, they are surging today after its first quarter earnings blew analyst expectations out of the water. The company is seeing a 29% jump in revenue year over year and reporting a much smaller loss than was expected. And that's where you see shares moving higher by more than 32% right now. This is one of those where I have to Google every time what it does. Um, do, yeah. you want to, do you want to hear what it does? MongoDB is built on a scale-out architecture that has become popular with developers of all kinds for developing scalable applications with evolving data schemas. Yes. I'll tell you what. I've been to a MongoDB conference before. What, and so, I, I still could hardly tell you the majority of what the company does. We, I know that they help companies build applications on top of cloud infrastructures that, oh, okay. that they've already built out. Is this going to be like a Zscaler situation where we get the company reaching out to us and saying, um, we Here's can come on and explain to you? Here's what we do. What we do. Um, that would be great. Similar to Twilio, yeah. Whatever uh, they're doing, it's going well. Look, there, there's some very nice people that work over there. I, I remember, because uh, this was back in the days when I was still working for the, the NASDAQ, and we were working with MongoDB towards uh, and leading up to the time when they were looking to go public. Went out to one of their conferences, learned a lot. I felt my brain expanding. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't retain a ton of it, so it's clearly. shrunk it's, back down. That, that part of it, yes, has shrunk back down a little bit in retaining. I had to move things around for other information <laughs> that we uh, retain on a daily basis. But still, an amazing reaction that we're seeing on the day in the share price move uh, as investors uh, who understand what the company does fully well, are, are looking well maybe maybe um, you know what I always look at the short interest yeah. it's actually not that high so this doesn't look like a huge short squeeze for mm. what it's worth yeah all right well we'll see how MongoDB shares continue to do as we move on throughout the rest of today's session coming up though here to help talking with nice CEO Rock Elam who is uh, joining us for a look at how conversational AI is changing the customer service game. That's coming up.
Welcome back. We're about 20 minutes into the start of the trading session here in the U.S. Dow, S&P 500, NASDAQ, all in positive territory. Let's get over to Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery as we've been monitoring the reaction on a hotter than expected jobs report this morning now, Jared. Yes, check this out. The markets are running with the information to the upside. Dow up over 1%. And guess what? The Nasdaq is underperforming uh, the Dow and the S&P 500 today. It's up about half a percent. That is a flip from the normal price action. And I want to show you a longer term chart on the S&P 500. This is going back three months, but you can see we clearly broke out of the recent trading range. And if I go back a year, you can see we are heading towards those August highs. And if we take a look at the Nasdaq, it's already soared above those. And let's see if we can get that right there. Um, well, there you go. Actually, just about equaling those. So interesting to see that going on. Want to show you what's happening in volatility with the VIX. And let me dial this down to a three month. You can see we are heading to new lows. Haven't seen these levels for a long time. On a three year basis, you can see heading back into that range we saw during uh, that very quiet period, well, quiet relative for the time uh, when we did see a lot more bullish uh, tailwinds in the market. Finally, here is the B of A move index. I've been tracking bond volatility. It has been ticking down now two days. These are as of yesterday's close, so we'll get another print today, but that is heading in the right direction. I want to show you what's going on in sector action today. Materials and energy, those are the two big leaders there. Consumer discretionary also up nicely, but uh, with respect to materials and energy, one of the things that stood out in this report this morning, strength in construction, and that's kind of the canary in the coal mine, but it is running really strong right now. Maybe that's why we're seeing the Dow outperforming a little bit today. We got JPM, that's JP Morgan up 2%, Nike up 3%. I do want to hit China. So we've got to segue to this real quick. We are seeing a big rebound in a lot of these shares. We know that they have been depressed recently. Chinese government uh, bending over backwards to try and support the property sector right now. But that big reopening that we saw earlier in the year really hasn't materialized just yet. So they're feeding that and trying to stabilize the situation. At what point do they really consider devaluing the UN? Because that has been heading in the direction of a weakening Chinese currency here. If I can just show this, this is the last thing I want to show. I promise, there we go. Um, let me just put this on a line chart. So the direction up here, that means the US dollar is strengthening, the UN is weakening. Um, in the past, this is one of the escape valves, one of the release valves for the uh, Chinese government. And if we do surpass these levels from 2018, 2019, I think that would be a huge deal because look, the trend is toward more volatility, at least on a technical analysis basis for the UN. So we'll have to see how that evolves, guys. Jared, thanks a lot. Interesting stuff. Um, we've been talking about AI, of course. AI is playing a larger role in the customer service space, in particular streamlining customer requests to address issues faster and to predict future roadblocks. The result, at least ideally, happier customers and human workers with more time to focus on higher value tasks. By 2025, 70% of all digital workplace service transactions will be done via automation, compared with just 30% today. That's according to Gartner Research. Software solutions company Nice is bringing conversational AI to the customer experience with their CX-1 system. The company currently partners with more than 25,000 organizations worldwide, including American Airlines, Disney, and Morgan Stanley. Barack Alam, the CEO of NICE, joined us now with how AI is shaping the future of the customer service experience. Um, as we, t I mean, customer service, I have to say, writ large, is not well regarded in a lot of fields, especially when you're not interacting in person, right? I think about telecom companies. I think about airlines, which we just mentioned. So how can we make it better? Is this going to help make it better? I, I truly believe so. You know, we, uh, I've been in this space for about 24 years and I've you know, been the, the, the CEO of uh, NICE for 10 years. And you know, AI is, is a true game changer for the industry of uh, customer service. If you think about it, the ideal way of what we want as consumers, we want almost a personal uh, service uh, individual in every company that will, will be dedicated just for us. Obviously, it's not really effective and brands cannot really afford to do that. What AI brings to the, to the table is this whole notion of mass personalization at scale. So, you know, it will take time and enterprises are just now, we're in the early innings of enterprise adoption of AI, but that for the first time really bring the ability to have this breakthrough 
uh, in the customer service space. And so in, in customer service, as kind of Julie was alluding to though, we are looking for that human connection because there's often more understandability. How does AI actually get past where the, those pitfalls might be because it's AI and, and not us actually speaking to somebody? And how does that impact a company too? Because that's business lost if that experience doesn't go as planned because they've invested in AI. So first, you're absolutely right that brands understand that, you know, customer service today is very strategic for all brands. You know, the most important assets are the, uh, uh, the consumers. And what AI brings to the table, I think, is three things, and it's not just one silver bullet. Mm -hmm. The first one, you know, it is an industry, or the whole notion of customer service that is very rich with people. There are 15 million employees that work only in customer service around the globe. This is a, this is a highly uh, skilled labor and there is a need for more of them. What AI brings to the table is the ability to really uh, you know, provide amplification of that skill labor and get them to be much more effective with, uh, as they interact with uh, consumers. The second is the whole idea of the ability to take decisions at a much faster velocity by organization and take care of you as a consumer right now and not just in the day or two uh, from now. Mm -hmm. And the third is what I said about the mass personalization at scale. It's not gonna be just one thing. It's not everything gonna go uh, into AI. We see it already today with what we do with uh, uh, customers and enterprises. It's the, how do you inject AI into well-established process of customer service? So just to make it very concrete for people, when I'm doing a, ch a live chat with whatever company, let's say my phone company, which I may or may not have, in, uh, my internet provider, which I may or may not have interacted with earlier in the week, I'm typing into the chat and the bot comes back to me and says whatever it says, which is not what I wanted from this company. So is it already being put in place through some of your products that it will better understand what I want and give me back a better response? And then also when I get connected with the human, cue the human perhaps in a better way. Is that what's already happening in your product? We are in our products, yes. I think we are kind of in a, in, we are in a certain race right now of businesses adopting AI. And this experience you have with your phone company or any other company is yet truly empowered by AI. Uh, you know, we've seen in the last few months individuals adopting AI out there, generative AI. We all experienced that. It's very cool. When enterprises think about adopting AI, there are a few other things that need to be taken into account. It needs to be extremely precise. So the experience that you have will be extremely precise with the, uh, with the brand. It needs to be compliant and secured. It needs to be aligned with the brand business goals and, and you know, what they want to achieve from the interaction uh, with you. And of course, it needs to be tightly connected to all the backend system. And that's how you'll, you'll get to a much better experience. And we, at the end of the day, it does need to connect at the important moments to that service individual that sits on the other hand and can intervene in the moment that there is some ambiguity about your intent as a consumer so you won't get lost in this journey. Um, so we were talking earlier in the show about how this is very conceptual right now and we want more concrete. So tell me concretely what the demand is for this product from your customers right now. The demand is extremely high and enterprises understand today that you know, generative AI uh, is really the next big thing. However, the interaction we have with customers, and we have 25,000 customers, we cater to the 85% you know, of the Fortune uh, 100, is that they cannot take just you know, generic generative AI and put it into uh, their environment. From the reasons I've mentioned before about security and compliance and uh, you know, er zero uh, tolerance for errors and, and, and alignment to the brand. So we are right now seeing a, a dramatic uh, increase in both the demand for the solution that we have. We have a platform called CX1 and it's a core AI called Enlighten. And that's basically the difference between you know, generic generative AI that you see out there versus you know, an AI that businesses can trust. And that's can, what we bring to customers. Can you put some numbers around it for us? We'll so we, we reported earnings right. about a few weeks ago and we talked about you know, dramatic increase on the number of, of our AI revenues. They are going at uh, you know, three figures of percentages. And I can tell you that right now already, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, you know, as, as the year progresses, many of our deals are now uh, you know, uh, double and triple in size 
due to the addition of, uh, of AI, which I think in general, we're gonna see a change in where the AI value go. Right now, you see it in the market in the semiconductor, classic beginning of any, every technology wave. It will go up to the infrastructure level, but eventually it will end up with the specialized applications. What, what is the benchmark margin contribution that you would like to see from your AI investments at the company? So, you know, we, we run on a very uh, healthy gross margin as a company. We run at the north of 70%, and overall operating margin is closer to the 30%, and AI is extremely accretive to our margins. Mm -hmm. All right, Barak, thank you so much for, for being here. Barak Alam is CEO me. of NICE. Coming up, we're bringing you more coverage outside the studio on this Jobs Friday, plus a conversation with the CEO of CrowdStrike is coming up in the next hour, following that company's earnings report and the state of cybersecurity. Stay tuned. We have got much more Jobs Day coverage coming up from the Walmart worker in Arkansas to the owner of one of New York's most famous, probably, and I would say brunch shops. We're telling you how the labor market is impacting everyday Americans. Akiko Fujita will join us from the Hollywood strike in California, where thousands of writers are battling the country's biggest studios. Our Jennifer Schonberger is in Washington, D.C. for reaction from the White House. And Ali Canal is going to join us from right here in New York City with the pulse on the hospitality industry, which is still struggling to recover from the depths of the pandemic. Coming up, Apple's big developer conference is on tap next week. We'll tell you what to expect and what could possibly be unveiled. That's next.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman with Brad Smith, and we have Rochelle Akufo joining us now as well. And as we take a look at what's going on in the markets here, uh, we've got stocks. Uh, I'm looking at the two-day chart here just to show you the uptick that we saw in today's session, the leg up uh, as we got the jobs numbers up a one and three quarters percent over the past two days. And then if you take it to the one day here, we have that three quarters of a percent increase. We've been watching yields as well here, and we are seeing yields move up today. Not a huge gain, though, up just about... Uh, four basis points. And what does that mean? Yes, there is an outlook here that uh, this report is perhaps more bullish for rates moving higher. At the same time, we didn't see expectations change that much for what the Fed is going to do at its next meeting. So interesting there that still being priced in for a pause. Going to reset here to the sectors, which Brad checked on earlier. And, um, and we're looking at year to date. So don't want to shock people, as Brad put it earlier. <laughs> we still have communication services and utilities. Utilities before was in the red, now communication services as well. Materials, energy, uh, consumer discretionary, industrials, all up uh, in pretty determined fashion here today. Rochelle, as you watch the market action, as you took in the jobs numbers, what are some of your thoughts here now that we're, what, in about a uh, half hour into the session? I mean, even at the at the highest of the expectations, we're putting it at maybe 250,000 jobs added by some estimates. But for this blowout jobs report, 339,000. I mean, it, it really did leave a lot of people scratching their heads. But I mean, when you look at what the job market has been up against, you've got persistent inflation over a year's worth of interest rate hikes, bank failures, recession fears to still come in with a, in with a number that strong. Very impressive. I know we were also taking a look at labor force participation. Usually this does tend to take up when you see the unemployment rate go up as well as a lot of more unemployed people are saying look maybe this is a good time for me to get back into the job market here but that stayed steady unchanged at 62.6 percent and that really does build on some of the jolt states that we saw that really does speak to a still hot labor market. I mean, the jolt data showed 10.1 million job openings at the end of April. That's about 1.8 vacancies for every unemployed person. So still leaves with the Fed with a lot of work to do here, potentially, if they're trying to hone in on that inflation data, as well as seeing just only that slightly uptick that we're seeing now in that unemployment rate. They're now at 3.7 percent. Yeah, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in Jerome Powell's house while he's <laughs> sipping his green tea. Just getting a load of these numbers this morning here. A lot of work to be done for sure, Rochelle. Also, Apple's 2023 Worldwide Developers Conference kicks off on Monday. Analysts and tech fans have high expectations for the event. Joining us now to give some key insights is a former Apple executive. He was the founding director of the Apple App Store and now advises developers who want to get their apps into the App Store. We've got Philip Schumacher, who is the Identity.com executive director. Philip, great to have you here with us today. First and foremost, when you think about the WWDC event and how critical it has become over the years, largely because of the role that you played in getting the Apple App Store really kind of off to the races, where does Apple need to continue to move forward with its relationship with those developers? What could they possibly announce to continue to invigorate excitement among that core base? Well, it seems like all the excitement right now, at least at Apple, is around this virtual reality, augmented reality headset. And that gives Apple yet another platform on which to sell apps, which helps drive business, right? That's the big thing this year. What's happening in the developer community? Are, are people, you know, given that they haven't actually introduced the product yet, do developers sort of pre-develop in anticipation of that kind of product, or do they have to wait till they have the actual specs? Many of us, you know, have to wait. Uh, there are uh, always a select anointed few that uh, developers that Apple uh, gives hardware to and allows them to start experimenting. But most of us have to sit on the sidelines and wait for the hardware to actually get released, which is typically at WWDC, and which is a super exciting time for developers in general on this platform because you have no idea what they're ultimately going to release because they have such a good secret engine inside. And Philip, we know that Meta did try and steal some of Apple's thunder by releasing its Quest 3. And you also, of course, have Sony's PSVR headset. But when you think of Apple and the ecosystem that this would be built into, talk about the competitive edge here. And most importantly, who is the ideal user for this? Yeah, so many of the headsets right now are cumbersome, they're large, they're difficult to use. And once you get in to start playing with them, they're not all that 
compelling, right? I, I play with all of those headsets that you mentioned, and I'm excited by seeing what Apple has because they're always going to do something that's a bit different, that's more customer focused, less developer focused, more customer focused to make it easier and something more uh, uh, complete for somebody to be able to use. So that's the real exciting thing is Apple released something that said, code new worlds. And so developers are chomping at the bit to figure out exactly what that means. But first of, first and foremost, what Apple focuses on, other than the, the, the fit and finish of the device, is how to bring amazing new technologies to people in, an, in a way that people hadn't seen yet. And that's what's really exciting is the user experience that we're going to see from the Reality Pro headset, if that's what it's ultimately called. Phil, I've, I've played lightsaber DDR Max on these headsets before, and that was the best experience. I, I'm just trying to figure out why everybody's trying to push a headset on me. Why do, why do we need the headset from the tech company's perspective? Right, right. I hear you. And it's it's an interesting time because honestly, metaverse and virtual reality is kind of passe right now, right? Didn't we forget about it when, when artificial intelligence, uh, generative AI came around? So I think some exciting things that, that are going to be is, is imagine these devices being used with uh, generative AI as well. And I think that's one of the things Apple is going to be doing this time is showing us that they've got to focus on AI. It's going to be embedded in the headset. And that's why you're going to want to wear those headsets is so you can have some real-time feedback and real-time interaction with an AI bot rather than doing it through command line typing on your machine. Well, that's a really good point, Philip, because um, when Apple reported its earnings, there were some questions about why it wasn't being more generative AI forward, if you will, like so many other companies have been. But when, what you're describing, I guess I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it. Like how... What's the opportunity here for Apple? How is that going to work if I'm wearing the thing and interacting? What does it do for me, I guess, is the question. Yeah, so virtual reality is going to be one of those things that embeds you in a different environment. Augmented reality is going to allow you to see your external world with things overlaid on top of it. So imagine if you were looking around the mountains around right outside your house and trying to figure out what's the name of each one. It will overlay the names of the mountains all around you. It will overlay the names of vehicles, things like that. And so for me, the AI, the generative AI, is just going to have a real-time interactive feedback of what you're seeing, what you're hearing, and what you're doing, and be able to help guide you, if you will. That's, to me, the real interesting aspect of these future augmented reality devices. Help me deal better with, with my reality right now. And Philip, when you look at the price tag, though, $3,000, I mean, already trying to afford a Quest is a bit of a stretch for people. When you have that price tag, I mean, I feel like there should be some expectations that come with this in terms of perhaps some of the hardware or other software that would really be built in to, to support this and make it something that people will use more widely. What do you think about this price tag here? Oh, the price tag is horrendous. It's it's going to be a tough pill to swallow, and they're probably not going to sell as many of those as they do iPhones every year. But it's a beginning, right? And especially if you have to wear a, a, a belt or something in your back pocket uh, for the battery pack, which is what we're hearing, uh, it's a rough, rough uh, set. You want virtual reality head, headset to be like glasses. You don't want there to be any more cumbersome than that. But look, we're about five years away from that. So I am worried about the price tag. That is way steep. That's three times the price of an iPhone. It's, it's, a, it's a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, and probably the uh, telecom companies are not going to spring for it, at least not yet, like they do for your iPhone these days, uh, at least more so than they used to. Philip, thank you so much. Really helpful context here. Philip Shoemaker is Identity.com Executive Director and Founding Director of the Apple App Store. We'll see what we hear from Apple. Thank you. And let's take a trend look at one trending ticker that we are watching. Shares of ChargePoint are on the list. They're down about 1% right now. They were moving more earlier uh, despite Moot reporting better than anticipated sales numbers for the first quarter, the company did come out with guidance that was lower than expectations, now expecting sales of between $148 million and $158 million in the current quarter. ChargePoint had been trending downwards really year to date and then recently got more of a bump as there was some more bullish chatter around the company and there's been a lot of talk about adding uh, to the EV charging network nationwide. Coming up, May jobs numbers coming in hotter than expected. And we'll get some commentary from the White House on the other side of the break.
May jobs numbers came in hotter than expected, with the U.S. adding 339,000 jobs last month. Let's get to Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schonberger, who's standing by for an important conversation on this. Jennifer? Thanks, Rochelle, for White House reaction to this blowout number. I am joined now by Heather Boucher, one of President Biden's advisors on the Council of Economic Advisors. Heather, thank you so much for joining me here on the North Lawn. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in person. So 10 consecutive rate hikes and still this job market not cooling, surprising to the upside. Your reaction? Well, this is certainly a good jobs report and it's way better than expected. And um, you know, what it means is that millions of American families are able to access the labor, you know, access good jobs right now, get those jobs. Um, we're seeing people continue to enter the labor force and stay in there. We actually now um, have labor force participation rates that are higher than at any point since January of 2007 for prime age workers, workers between 25 to 54. So this certainly is a good labor market. It's one that's drawing people in, keeping them in the labor force, and providing um, that access to the economic security that Americans need. Some have pointed to the strength in the job market, saying that there could be structural issues at play, perhaps um, some uh, effects that are left over from the pandemic, lower immigration, long haul COVID, certainly people who have died off from COVID. What do you think can be done about low immigration to increase the size of the labor pool here? We keep hearing about a shortage of workers. Well, here's the thing. Um, you know, a shortage of workers is a mismatch between the demand for workers and the supply available. And one way to fix that is to make sure that worker, that employers are offering good jobs. And that's one of the things we've seen over the course of this recovery is that the extent to which employers are offering those good jobs, we're seeing nominal wage gains. That's drawing people in. It's bringing them into the labor force, bringing them into that employment. So that gives me a lot of hope that there's still room uh, to grow there. Now again, prime age labor force participation, those workers in their, their peak yearning years, 25 to 54, that's back to where it was in January of 2007, but it's not as it all, at its all-time peak. We certainly have some room to go for people who are here in the U.S. economy that could be entering the labor force. Fed officials are closely watching this report. Uh, we heard from a couple officials this week who suggested that perhaps uh, they should hit the pause button when it comes to raising rates at the next meeting in June to sort of take a step back, assess, and then perhaps resume raising again this summer. Do you think that's a prudent approach at this juncture? Well, I can't comment on Fed policy, but what I can tell you is that they're looking at, you know, we're, we are looking right now at a, at a strong labor market, one where we're not seeing um, rises uh, in unemployment claims, one where, job, where people are not quitting their jobs or getting laid off, one where we're seeing, um, you know, this strong employment alongside wage gains that while they are, um, you know, good in nominal terms and are, you know, for the most part, keeping pace with inflation, they aren't sort of at the blockbuster pace that they were before. That pace has been slowing. So that should give, that, that gives us some indication that there's a bit of cooling in the economy and hopefully we are finding that, that place where we can continue to see that job creation month after month, continue to see those nominal wage gains month after month without um, needing to um, see the overheating that people are concerned about. I want to ask you about AI and I know it's early innings right now, but as you look out, what impact do you think this is going to have on the labor market? There have been some analysis Analogies to automation, perhaps AI is automation on steroids. Uh, what sorts of impacts do you think we'll see in terms of evolution? Well, you know, here's the thing. The economy is always undergoing technological changes. We've seen this, you know, time and again, and certainly that can affect, you know, what kinds of work needs to get done, how that work is how that work is done and what you need from people versus machines, right? That's really the crux of this issue. This is about, you know, where and how technology can replace human labor and what that, what, you know, what makes sense for employers. What we've seen in prior uh, technological changes is a lot of times uh, technology is labor augmenting. So it's not uh, so much necessarily destroying all the jobs, but it's changing people's jobs. Like computers changed the way we worked. We didn't use typewriters. You know, there was um, you know a change in the need for stenographers because you could you know uh, type directly into your computer. But that didn't mean that um, we saw the disappearance of jobs. So I think as we're looking at AI from the labor market perspective, what we really want to understand is which jobs are going to see. Some 
some of that augmentation and which ones might be um, you know totally shifted out of the economy and how do we think about that transition for those workers in there in the communities that they live in switching gears a bit we're going to hear from the president tonight he's going to address the nation on the debt ceiling what can we expect to hear from the president and secondly what can be done to in essence sort of suspend the debt ceiling here uh, it seems every couple of years the US credit rating it becomes in jeopardy because of this brinksmanship. We're one of the only countries in the world who has a debt ceiling. So what can be done about that? Well, this is such a, it, uh, it's from an economics perspective, it's a challenging issue because in some times the debt ceiling, you just get this clean increase, you don't talk about it, it's just the normal order of business. And sometimes you go really close to the brink. I think what's really important this week is to acknowledge this you know, historic bipartisan compromise, this deal that was come to between the president and leaders in Congress and the Republicans to, to, get, to move past this, to say, you know, we can come together, we can make a deal to um, raise the debt ceiling and then address some of the, the budget challenges where of course you know different parties are going to disagree and that's that's what that's what happens in a democracy so I think the important thing today is that we have a deal um, and that um, that you know the president did not have to compromise on his core economic principles right he did not have to do anything that would jeopardize the security of Social Security or Medicare um, and you know was able to protect uh, students and veterans and other workers across the economy and what can we expect to hear from the president tonight as he addresses the nation? I think the president is, um, I'm, I'm sure the president will be relieved, just as we all are, that we're able to move past this moment, able to avoid the potential catastrophic consequences for the U.S. economy of blowing past the debt ceiling, but also proud of the fact that um, parties were able to come together and get this done in a way that, um, you know, does, uh, will, will help and support the U.S. economy. Heather, thank you so much for your insight. So appreciate it. Hope to speak with you again soon. Thank you. That's Heather Boucher, President Biden's member of the Council of Economic Advisors. I'll send it back to you guys in the studio. All right. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Appreciate it in the conversation there. Guys, coming up, CrowdStrike is bouncing back today after taking a hit in trading yesterday. We're going to speak with the CEO next. This does uh, take the threat of default off the table for the foreseeable future through January 2025. Well, the next step now is for the legislation to go through the Senate. Republicans and Democrats are eager to claim wins for both sides, for both of their respective parties. There's a lot of provisions here that would revert spending to last year's levels, and there's going to be there, appropriators now are going to have to fill in the blanks as to how they're actually going to go about apportioning the spending of the deal. It's a big win financially for the country, but it's also a big win politically for both McCarthy and Biden. I think this is a big win for the moderates uh, in this country, and we haven't seen a win like that for a while. This is the first time in over a decade that we've had a budget framework or deal that actually made the fiscal situation better, not worse. We have been adding on more and more to the debt, which is why we're currently in such a dangerous fiscal position. Second, there was a bipartisan bill that did something hard instead of easy. And the art of compromise came back through this bill. And so we are nowhere close to done on what needs to get done. But if this is the first step in moving towards more bipartisan efforts on fiscal policy, that would be a tremendous achievement. To pause or not to pause, that is the question for the Fed. And it's very clear that the committee is not of one mind. I think the Fed has indicated a willingness to pause, and they still may do so. But I want to be clear, any decision to move to the sideline temporarily will be made in spite of the data. The data, particularly the inflation data, do not support a pause at this point. We've got shares of CrowdStrike moving lower by about 2% today. Stock fell yesterday as well after the company's 42% jump in revenue from last year. But that wasn't enough to convince investors who were focusing on billings. The stock fell double digits following the cybersecurity company's first quarter earnings despite its upbeat outlook. CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz is with us now with more on this. George, thanks for joining us. It's good to see you. So um, talk us through, it seems as though the street was sort of focusing on billings here. Um, but I, I'm guessing you think probably that attention was misplaced. So now that you've had sort of a day Talk to us about how you're thinking about the sort of perception of the of the numbers. Yeah, I, look, I think we had a strong quarter, particularly in a, uh, a challenging macro environment. And uh, if you look at uh, you know what we posted in terms of 
revenue and uh, non-GAAP and now GAAP profitability for the first time, which was a record, uh, record free cash flow. Um, these are these are all strong metrics, and um, as as we've always talked about, and in particular our C, CFO Bert Podbear, uh, ARR is really the best proxy. We as a company, we we really don't even focus on billings, and um, when you think about billings, it's just timing issues. So ARR is really the best proxy, and um, you know I think overall it was a strong quarter, and you know it was beat and raised. And George Rochelle here, being a cloud native platform, you were able to grow the company a lot faster when we compare where you were when you first went public. And a lot of investors still looking for that next phase of the growth story here. Do you think that's a fair yardstick to measure the company by based on, on where the company is right now? Well, if you look at growth and uh, growth and profitability put together on a rule of 40 basis, we're 75. And keep in mind, uh, we're 2.7 billion dollars in annual recurring revenue. So to be able to have a rule of 40 at 75% in, from a free cash flow basis, it's absolutely incredible. We continue to drive growth because we continue to drive innovation and customer adoption. Uh, we've got many things that are coming into play. Some of the other areas, emerging areas for us are log management and XDR or SIM. Um, identity is a, is a big area. So cloud, of course, we've done extremely well in those areas. And we continue to, to um, drive new routes to markets uh, with our managed service providers, Dell relationship, AWS, et cetera. So we feel pretty good about our prospects and uh, it really has to come, come back to customer adoption and wanting to stop breaches. George, over the course of this earnings season, we've heard a ton of talk about artificial intelligence. Some of it actually seems attainable depending upon how executives are speaking about it uh, and how it's going to be a benefit to their business. And, and some of it just seems like it's contributing to the hype phase because in those instances, it's almost like you could take out AI and reinsert metaverse or reinsert blockchain or whatever the hype of that or the flavor of that time would be. But for CrowdStrike, how do you see this actually coming to fruition? This was d discussed within your own earnings and, and on the call as well. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of hype around AI and a lot of people uh, kind of throw the term around. We were, I actually started the company based upon AI back in 2011. Uh, now AI has advanced into generative AI, but this is not something new for CrowdStrike. Uh, we have deep D DNA in this area, deep expertise. And what I was talking about speci specifically in our earnings call was generative AI, which we launched called Charlotte AI which is a virtual security analyst, if you will. And it takes the collective knowledge of CrowdStrike and puts that in the hands of our analyst. And really what that is focused on is allowing um, customers to interact with our technology in a different way. Typically, a customer will come into it, the user interface, click around, do some alerts, uh, look at some alerts, et cetera. Now you can actually have a conversation and drive workflows, which we call generative workflows within the product. So we're really excited about it. We previewed it with some customers. They were extremely excited about it. And uh, I think it's going to be a game changer for CrowdStrike. George, um, I know it's very early days. As you said, you're just previewing it with people. They're excited about it. Can you put any numbers around it? I mean, is, how is that? Is it a bolt-on offering to what they are already buying from CrowdStrike? Can you talk to us about the cost and how many folks are, yeah, sure. are signing to actually get this? Yeah, set? right. Well, it's in preview right now. So we've got uh, folks looking at it, trying it out, et cetera. So really the way we're looking at it is it's a foundational platform element. So it'll be part of the platform. Uh, which will drive additional module adoption. We talk about the number of attached rates, uh, the number of modules that we attach uh, over uh, quarter by quarter, and uh, they continue to increase. So basically it makes our product better, faster, cheaper, stickier, and drives down the cost for our customers. We'll look to have additional monetization in the future, but just by having it in the product, it's going to drive additional module adoption. The second piece of that is we pioneered this. We use this internally with things like our Falcon Complete Service, and it helps drive additional incremental margin revenue, which, as you've probably seen from our uh, earnings call, we had record gross margin margin at 80%, non-GAAP gross margin. Um, that is substantial and drives uh, bottom line results. And George, CrowdStrike's in an interesting position because not only can you sort of use AI, generative AI within your own company, but also you have a lot of companies trying to beef up their, their cybersecurity as well, which then you also get to benefit from. Talk about the sort of adversarial relationship that comes with some of these bad actors that are entering AI and generative AI and how CrowdStrike is positioned for that. Sure. George? Oh, it looks like we might, George, do we still have you? 
Oh, well, it looks like, unfortunately, we had a little bit of a frozen shot there. I was really interested. They talked about this on the call a little bit, by the way. What yeah. Michelle was just asking about the idea that, unfortunately, bad actors are getting more sophisticated because they're able to use uh, AI and generative AI as well. And uh, he talked about on the call, he and colleagues, about... Um, you know, on the plus side, if you are an analyst with a certain level of training, you can really up your capabilities with this. But on the flip right. side, a bad actor who doesn't have as much expertise can also increase their abilities using AI and generative AI specifically. It also serves as a, as a solid reminder in what George was just mentioning a moment ago. Artificial intelligence as related to cybersecurity is not new. Right. I've it, sat but inside it's the large language exactly. models and how they apply to it that right. are new. And how quickly that could actually turn around code to block other instances where they're already going out and being able to kind of safeguard against vulnerabilities there. And so the ability to write code that quickly to patch up vulnerabilities, that is good for cybersecurity on the other side and on the same side where you've already got these AI or cybersecurity command centers that have already leveraged AI for so long as well. Just this in a different facet for sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, coming up, everyone, Ali Canal is on site at NYC Brunch Icon Bubby's. Oh, yeah, she's got the, uh, those are the pies there. I've had the pancakes there. They're pretty good, too. She's got the inside look at the state of restaurants and more. The May jobs report dropped earlier this morning with the leisure and hospitality industry trending upwards. The vast majority of them were in the food services and drinking places. Those jobs added with over 33,000 positions added in that sector alone. We've got Yahoo Finance's Ali Canal live from Bubby's Tribeca location in New York City. She's joined by Bubby's chef and owner, Ron Silver. Ali, take it away. What a spread. Hi, Brad. And as you can see, we're at Bubby's. Look at this spread. It is popping here on a Friday. One of the hardest brunch reservations to get in New York City. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. You've been in business for 33 years. From a labor perspective, what's the secret to attracting that talent, both the wait staff as well as your cooks? Well, you know, a lot of people who have uh, work at Bubby's have been here for 20 years or more than that. Some, some people have started when they were like 14 and they're 40 now. So one of the things is just that we have a real community. Uh, we pay a lot more than most restaurants do. And, um, well, 
when Bubby is, is successful, all my entire crew is successful. You said you pay more than most restaurants. So what sort Definitely. of incentives are you offering employees? And really, what do they want right now? Well, what they want right now is to be paid well and to have a personal life respected so that there's a, you know, so that it really is not, um, I think there's a certain amount of freedom of, uh, of having a personal life that may not have been thought about before the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that that is, there's more flexibility right now and more sort of liberty in our crew. So you have hourly wages, and then on top of that is the tipping. We have some of our crew gets tipped. The front of the house gets tipped, and the back of the house does, doesn't get tipped. Got it. And in terms of tipping, you know, we're dealing with inflation, a lot of high prices right now. Are you seeing consumer behavior shifting on the amount that they're willing to tip servers? I have not seen anything like that, but I, and I haven't heard anything like that here. So it seems like everybody's happy at mm -hmm. Bubby's. And you brought up the pandemic. We're in this post-pandemic world now. How are you able to weather that storm from a labor perspective and really keep the doors open during that time? Well, we really were flexible and had a lot of enthusiasm to do whatever we could. And as soon as we could uh, open outdoors, we did. You know, I grew up in Utah in the mountains, so I'm sort of used to thinking about eating outside in weird weather. Mm -hmm. And so we really were able to lean in to all the opportunities as they happened without sort of wondering if it was Armageddon or a pandemic. I admit, I was one of those people that weathered the storm quite literally in order to eat outside. And, you know, when we talk about inflation and price increases, have you had to raise menu prices and, and pass on some of that cost to the consumer? We have had to do it, and we've been very judicious about it. You know, we're really making sure to just sort of cover our expenses rather than turning our price point into something else. Because, you know, for, you know, Bubby's, Bubby's has a certain sort of middle point where we fit in and I don't want to start getting into the overly expensive category. And where have you seen the biggest price increases? We've seen certain ingredients like eggs skyrocket and eggs, that's a place. chocolate, coffee, um, you know, meat, mm -hmm. all kinds of things have been just inching their way up for all kinds of reasons. So how do you battle those inflationary pressures? I mean, we really just keep a close eye on our costs and we adjust when we need to. We don't hesitate to do it if we need to. And, you know, so far it's worked out. And I would say that in the end result, our check average is up maybe 5% from what it was or 6%. And are you, are you seeing consumers change the way they order, maybe ordering less, sharing more? Well, no, I think that people are, people who are coming to Bubby's are having, seem to be having the same experience as they were before, or more so in a way. Okay. And then in terms of, you know, in-dining versus delivery, because during the pandemic, delivery really became a popular option. Are you seeing those levels revert to pre-pandemic times? Are you still seeing delivery a very popular option right now? Well, what we saw really was that our delivery business went up by about 500% and stayed there. So it really, it really is a completely new revenue center for us in a, in a meaningful way, the delivery business. And is in-dining back to pre-pandemic levels? We're up probably about 40% from wow. the pandemic. Now, I know you have a new cookbook. You're re-releasing this. Yes. All about pies. It's all about pie, pastry, seasonality. Okay, I'm someone that really can't cook a pie. So what is the secret to being able to create something like this? Well, one thing is that this is sort of the pinnacle, but there's ways to make, for example, a cookie crust pie that's so easy with graham crackers and there's homemade graham cracker recipe if, if you want to do that or you can buy commercial ones and so there's all kinds of levels of pie to make in there and it's really worth learning how to do a flaky pastry crust even though it's it takes a long time to be able to do it it's a labor of love right it takes years and years to figure to really understand it because you have to go to, through all the seasons or it changes all the time and it really is a learning process all right well i personally want to try some of this i believe this is the rhubarb pie right that's your favorite one rhubarb, yes all right
Well, guys, we're going to keep enjoying this pie. Back to you in the studio, Brad and Julie. I know you guys are jealous that you're not here with me right now. I feel like you're playing with my emotions right now as I'm looking at all that food. It looks fantastic. Thank you so much, our very own Ali Canal. Well, we want to give a shout out to our head of live, Val Caval, who's worked so hard to get us a true pulse check on the labor market this jobs day, putting in that work there, as you can see. Always lovely to see you. Thank you, Val. All right, coming up, it's been a rocky ride in the oil market lately. We take a closer look ahead of a crucial OPEC Plus meeting. That's next. Oil prices up more than 2% on Friday, easing on news of the U.S. debt ceiling deal. But now all eyes are on this weekend's OPEC Plus meeting. For now, there's no clear direction if the group will announce additional cuts. Last month's move to cut around 1.16 million barrels per day came as a surprise. This as Russia's oil ex exports have remained elevated, not slowing to the extent of the output cuts promised, pushing a rift between Russia and Saudi Arabia. Our Blue Line Futures president, Bill Baruch, joins us now with what to expect from OPEC Plus this weekend and what it means for oil. Thank you for joining us this morning here. So we were getting a bit of mixed messaging about, you know, potentially people trying to short oil, that warning we got out of Saudi Arabia. But then we also have Russia saying, you know, don't don't expect any cuts. What are your expectations going into these meetings? I, I think they're going to stand pat here. Um, you know, they cut, they, they announced that previous cut at the start of April and took effect in May. And, uh, you know, they haven't uh, 
announced another cut, a follow-up cut per se, uh, within three months of that initial cut. So I, I don't think that they're going to change anything at this time. Um, you know, they we markets are still anticipating a, a, a deficit in the back half of this year as demand picks up and, and China growth reinvigorates. And I, I'm on board with that. So I, I think they're going to be patient here, uh, though there is some friction growing between uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, as Russia continues to produce over that 500, uh, you know, thousand barrel per day uh, mark that they were supposed to hit on. Hey, Bill, it's Julie here. Just to kind of zoom out a little bit, we've seen oil really wavering lately. Yes, it's, we've got a little bit of a rebound today, but do you think that we're going to have a range bound situation through the summer, or do you think there's going to be a breakout one way or the other, whether it's the OPEC plus meeting or something else that's a catalyst? You know, I, I do think that uh, we're we're going to see oil uh, remain buoyant. I think the, the tailwinds, you know, as I mentioned, would, would be China growth coming back on. I think we're at, at a, if not quite there, maybe some peak pessimism from from on, on the China story. Uh, and uh, Chinese manufacturing PMI gave us a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, U.S. demand remains robust, and the White House will also have to uh, look to replenish that SPR. So, you know, in the next month, you know, we're going to look at that from SPR releases to potentially having to replenish that. And I think that's going to become a tailwind uh, for, for sentiment as well. Uh, and then when you get these these big washouts like we had over the past week, um, a lot of the time, if we're able to start to stabilize, you, you can quickly see traders and managers reposition. Uh, I think the the landscape within the, the equity space uh, for individual names is, is very robust right now, mm -hmm. too. I mean, there, a lot of these names are are hitting against support right now. I and mean, for instance, before before the show, I, I just, um, you know, added to things like a marathon petroleum uh, personally and and looking at, at things like that, that that there is a, a good outlook over the summer, uh, potentially improving uh, refinery margins as well. So that actually started to get to my next question is, would you be playing or, or fading specific oil and gas names going into this OPEC plus meeting? And it sounds like at least one of those names caught your attention. But what's the profile that you would be looking for across some other players? Well, we look for divergences within a landscape to bring opportunity. And, you know, this week. I, I manage a commodity fund, and this week we had a, uh, a sharp move lower. And I think one of the best ways, rather than for the viewers out there, rather than looking at uh, an option skew, it may, it may you know kind of gloss your eyes over talking about something like that. But you go to uh, the CME group; um, they have that Fed Watch tool that everybody knows about, but they also have an OPEC tool, uh, hmm. OPEC Watch tool, and it's now it's not as perfect as that fed watch tool i think the fed watch tool is amazing the the opec watch tool actually you know it, it too aligns off options volatility so you have a big sell-off because of a, a sort of change in narrative um that that took place you go back last week saudi arabia um in, within that uh, saudi arabia energy uh, energy minister within that interview uh, you know i think his comments were taken out of context that they were going to bring ouchies to to the to the shorts but i think he was referring back so kind of when people's heard about that. They heard about some of the rift within Russia and Saudi Arabia. We saw a big collapse uh, in oil prices. And first, that Chinese manufacturing PMI, the, the state-run number on Monday was or Tuesday night was, was, was a bad first read. So we had some some heavy selling. What that did was, was you know, push the option skew to, to really favor the puts were, were overpriced. So within that puts being overpriced, that OPEC watch tool uh, showed a probability, and still I think does, a 50-50 probability that they cut, uh, I'm sorry, that they add production or they leave unchanged. So I look for things like that being opportun bringing opportunity where puts are, are overpriced. You can actually look to sell some puts and buy some calls and some sort of risk reversal sort of move. Uh, or you know, that's the way we look to play it. Now, as we've rebounded, I've rolled that out to more, um, um, you know, limited risk call spread, kind of looking into this weekend. I think there is a bit of a tailwind for crude oil to, to trade higher. But there's opportunity, you know, as you get these sharp moves within the market uh, that I think you've got to be aware of. And that's how you want to look to, to take advantage of that and, and then position out, you know, within your broader thesis. And our broader thesis remains that, that crude oil has a pretty good shot this year to be back above $80. And how much of that is tied into what you're expecting in terms of the, the China demand side of the story? I, I think, I mean, leaning on what the IEA said uh, earlier this, well, back in May, uh, you know, they, they do expect China uh, reopening because 
the reopening tailwinds haven't shown up. Uh, we do think they will. And in right as everybody gets really negative as they are currently is typically when you can see something like that start to revert. Now we have, again, a light at the end of the tunnel with the private Caxton survey of Chinese manufactured PMI showing an expansion on Wednesday night. That really got crude oil started off of that floor, getting it back above $68. And now we find ourselves here back above 71. I was looking at 71 as, as a pretty big resistance. If that story continues to build tailwinds, uh, I, I think crude oil you know, could be a major driver uh, for crude oil to retest $80. The IEA seems to think so. I think OPEC Plus is still looking at those Chinese tailwinds. And, and China demand uh, for crude oil products uh, has remained strong within this uh, within this sort of deteriorating growth environment. So if they pick back up, I, I think that could be a pretty re a robust uh, component within a, a bullish narrative. All right, a lot to keep track on going into this OPEC Plus weekend meeting. Blue Line Futures President Bill Baruch joining us today. Thanks so much for the breakdown and the context there, Bill. Thank you. Absolutely. And we've got much more Jobs Day coverage ahead, from the Walmart worker in Arkansas to the owner of one New York City famous pie shop. We're telling you how the labor market is impacting everyday Americans. Akiko Fujita is going to join us from the Hollywood strike in California, where thousands of writers battle the country's biggest studios. And our Jen Schoenberger is in Washington, D.C. for reaction from the White House and Alec Now joining us from right here in New York City. You heard from her with the pulse on hospitality industry that's still struggling to recover from the depth of the pandemic. Much to continue to track there here as we're watching major averages still hold on to to gains this morning. Well, we've got much more coming up. The great debate today is all about the jobs report and that strong number, but not all jobs are created equally. What kind of employment are we creating and does it only really matter for the Fed? Don't miss our panel debate on this coming up next.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Acutho. Here's a recap of the day's top story this morning. May payrolls come in hotter than expected at 339,000, far exceeding expectations, and leading to more questions over the Fed's move at this month's policy meeting. And the data-dependent FOMC will be looking at the resilience of the labor market amid a swirl of economic headwinds. This week's data continues to reinforce the notion of a two-speed economy. Private payrolls also far exceeded expectations, while ISM data showed a seventh month of shrinking factory activity. First, let's check in on the major indices an hour and a half into the trading day. As we see their strong gains, we see the Dow, they're up about 1.5% here, about 490 points. Seeing those gains on that hot May jobs report and some relief over a debt ceiling de deal being reached in Congress. S&P 500, they're also up more than 1%, only seeing communications, the only laggard sector, all the others in the green. Also taking a look at the tech-heavy Nasdaq there, up about 0.9%, about 127 points. Let's also check in on the Treasury market as we see more people taking some of those worries off the table here. The short-term five-year yield up about 2.5%, the 10-year up 1.5%, and the longer-term 30-year yield up 0.676%. Well, in a world of misinformation, disinformation, corruption, and vested interest, data is one of the greatest assets we have. It is, in theory, unimpeachable. It tells a story free of bias, opinion, or motive. It simply is. But in the world of economic and monetary policy, it's still king. Policymakers rely on it in its totality to make decisions that impact all of us. For the Federal Reserve, the credo has long been that policy is never on a preset course. It adapts to changing information. Now, the jobs report and its headline number has cemented itself as the statistic that stands out from the crowd, summarizing the health of the world's biggest economy at a glance. Now, it's not meant to be a magic number, but it certainly has an outsized importance in shaping sentiment and changing decision making as well. But not all jobs are created equally. What kind of employment are we creating? What is the true rate of unemployment? Does any of this actually matter? Well, if the jobs report is just a blunt instrument guiding monetary policy, is it useless? Well, joining us now for the discussion, Yahoo Finance's Julie Hyman, Miles Udland, Shauna Smith, and our very own Josh Schaefer. Julie, over to you. Thanks so much, Rochelle. We're feeling very existential here, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> at Yahoo Finance, why are any of us here? Why are we even talking about the jobs report? And that's what we want to discuss. And I sort of have been thinking about this in two ways. One, is the jobs report accurate, for lack of a better word? Does it actually give us a picture of what's going on in the job market? And secondly, is it even the right number for the Fed and the market to be zeroing in on? And so to sort of take the accuracy question first, just one thing that I've been thinking about is the revision to the job report, which we get every month, right? We get the payrolls number every month. It has now beaten expectations for 14 straight months, which tells you something about the ability of economists to forecast this thing. But every month it gets revised, and the amount by which it gets revised varies pretty wild, widely. We've seen it get revised lower as of late, but again, that's very volatile. And I was even looking back at previous years and the sort of average revisions that we see on an annual basis, which again, monthly-wise, are really divergent. But overall, we have seen bigger revisions in more recent years than we had seen sort of pre-pandemic. So that's just taking sort of the accuracy piece of it. But there are a lot of different components of it. Shauna, you're looking at what I think. There are so many different yeah. components of it. And I think this report in particular is so hard to kind of figure out just in terms of how the Fed is looking at it, what it could mean for policy here going forward. You mentioned that headline number, a massive beat once again, the 14th, like you said, in a row. But when it comes to unemployment, that did tick higher up to 3.7%. So I was taking a look at labor force participation, more specifically what we're seeing in prime age workers. So that's the workers between 25 and 54 years of age. And that ticked higher, went from 83.3% to 83.4%. And I bring that up just because that might be one of the explanations in terms of why we did see the unemployment rate tick higher while we did get that blowout beat on the top line number on that massive uh, more than 300,000 jobs created last month. So certainly more people entering the workforce, but maybe they haven't found that job yet. So that's why we did see that uh, unemployment number tick higher. But I think that this is almost a head scratcher in terms of what exactly this means for the Fed, how the Fed should even be looking at this data. Because like you said, Julie, mm -hmm. so often it's, rev it's we've seen a number of revisions and they're pretty significant when you take a look at some of those trends. So I think 
there's still a lot of debate about whether or not we should see a pause, and then, of course, if we'll see another rate hike in July. Um. Well, I was, you know, I was going to steal your point about primary participation, but we'll let that one lie. Uh, 83.4% highest we've seen since 2007. Um, Julie, you know what I'm going to say about the accuracy of it, and my, my question is going to be, do you have any better ideas for uh, other, other data that we, well, would, in fact, that we would gather? In fact, actually, to that point, so, so last night I was at an event, and I was sitting next to the head of Homebase, which is a company that provides software that basically does employee management, particularly for hourly workers. Mm -hmm. So instead of like punching a time card, you would use this software. And he said to me he thinks that the way the government measures this is quite outdated, and I said to him, do you have it? So, okay, so what are you looking at then? And he pointed out data from the likes of Indeed and ZipRecruiter as being a better way to gauge what's going on. And he said, even more, look at those companies, see what they're doing with their own employees. Are they laying people off, as ZipRecruiter has been doing? So, that mm -hmm. also, I, I don't know if that's a better idea, but that's just a better idea well, that someone gave me. So, I think, I think the reason why we care about any jobs report is ultimately because it is going to most likely determine what the Fed is most likely going to do next. And that's really all the market cares about. And if you look at the market today, it is suggestive of a Fed that's likely to pause next month. I mean, look at the leaders in the market right now, regional banks, mm -hmm. kind of the Dow has been beaten down. It's been a laggard and the Dow is outperforming today. So that kind of tells you what investors think. And I think we all know I'm an absolutist about like the market is right. And then we will figure out why they're right about what they're saying. So that's kind of my view on it. And I think you know, looking at the labor market in general, though, and trying to make sense of this report, I mean, I don't actually think it's that complicated. I think the reason economists keep <laughs> getting the, the jobs number wrong, they're always wrong, but the reason they're wrong on the low side is because people have been waiting for the economy to yeah. roll over for months and months and months, and today's jobs report shows it's still not happening. Well, and the word slowdown should probably stop being used, right, as far as overall slowing down the job growth. I mean, it's the biggest number we've seen since January. You strip out January, it's the biggest number we've seen since August, right, as far as monthly growth goes. So that was something interesting just today as I was looking at different commentary. I think people are starting to change that narrative a little bit. But overall, I think a lot of people said you can take from this report what you want, right? You can make a lot out of the unemployment rate. You can make a lot out of wages coming down on a monthly rate compared to what they were last month. And you can then say, well, the Fed's getting a little bit of a win here. We're starting to see a slowdown. Or you can just look at the headline number and say, well, the economy is booming. The Fed should hike again. And it seems like a lot of people that were in that camp before today are still in the, It didn't change camps. It seems like everyone's still in their camp that they were in yesterday. And that's sort of where we're sitting. Yeah, but whether or not that's validated, I think, is the other big issue here. Because, Miles, like you're saying, that this is the jobs report is what the Fed does look at. But I actually question that, whether or not there's more emphasis on CPI now, the next inflation print that we are going to get right yep. before that meeting, whether or not that matters more, given the fact that this report you can take what you want from it, right. to Josh's point, just in terms of if you want to look at that rising unemployment number or if you want to look at that massive headline beat. Well, I think for the last 15 months, it has been true that inflation data is more important. And I think it still is more important because, you know, we saw the move in Fed fund futures last week when the PC, when PCE number came across that was, um, you know, firmer than expected. I think 4.6% increase in core PCE over last year. So still more than double the Fed's 2% target on their preferred measure. Some Fed speak this week kind of bumped it back, and we haven't seen a huge move in market expectations for the Fed based on jobs. So yes, I think inflation became the new jobs report, but ultimately, I think that the jobs report is where you get, let's say, the simplest read on the economy's health, because inflation is measuring a specific set of inputs and what you're paying for them. But how much people work and what they make while they work is most likely to have the largest impact on the overall story for the yeah. economy. Well, and guess what? The, what they're making is not going up. It's not meeting inflation, right? And it's, it's sort of stagnating if you look at those average hourly earnings. What I think, and this is, I guess, sort of I'm channeling Miles to some degree here, okay. is... Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> like, you could argue it's a lagging indicator, which many, most economists say it is a lagging indicator, and you can sort of quibble about what it actually tells us. But it's the easy, it's, there are two data points to me that are the easiest to relate to emotionally. One is the jobs report. Do I have a job or not? Does mm -hmm. the person who lives next to me have a job or not? And secondly, am I paying more for stuff? CPI and jobs. Emotionally, those are the ones that resonate the most with us in our everyday lives. You can talk about PMIs. Ah, you can yeah. talk about, you know, all of these other the PMIs. Well, but right? that's, you that's know how much I love the right. PMIs. Right. <laughs> but, but, but they don't have that same sort of intuitive, relatable understanding that jobs and CPI do. 
right? Well, to you. No, I agree. I to agree. me. To um, you. No, to my I people like brain. to talk about the unemployment rate. No, I, I agree. <laughs> I think people like to talk yeah, about it. I think this is the reason why jobs matter because you can, I mean, think about it in this framework uh, to use like the media example. If you're doing um, NBC Nightly News, can you put this in the A block? The answer is yes. You can't put PMI in the, you shouldn't put PMI in the show ever in any circumstance. But you can say, you know, the labor market says yes. X and you don't have to know anything about the economy to understand what the market, or not the market, what the, what the report is trying to tell you. Yeah, exactly. And I also think just, we haven't even just talked about the number of job openings that are still out there. That was over 10 million, the most recent report out there. So this whole supply demand imbalance. So people out there, even if you're surveying who has a job, who doesn't have a job, I think the overarching though question that still remains is what exactly is going to happen with that supply demand imbalance. We still have labor shortages when you take a look at some specific sectors, construction being one of those, uh, leisure and hospitality, where we did see some gains this uh, this past month here, but certainly we're what over 300,000 jobs shy of where we were in hospitality before I the pandemic. I think overall, though, if we want to talk about data, we could talk about how many of those jobs are repeat postings yep. or how mm -hmm. long have they been up to, right? right? When we talk about over 10 million job openings, how many of those jobs are actually open yeah. and have are actually looking to get filled? We're never going to have that answer, but I think that's probably the problem and part of that data. Too. Yeah, I, I'd be more interested in having that conversation about is the JOLTS report as good as we want it to be versus like is the, you know, is the BLS. Well, have that, have that another idea. idea. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's well, it. That's no, it. because it's, it's tabulating open jobs at the end of the month, but yeah. it's like how do yes. you qualify what is open, what's not. And I think, you know, your home bases, your Indeeds, your zip recruiters would have a lot of ideas um, in that direction of how many listings are ghost listings, how many listings are you actively trying to fill. What's the difference between actively trying to fill a job and, you know, a job just hasn't come through because you can't find the right candidates? Well, and I think... Something that we've been sort of talking about, too, to your point, Sean, is what does all of this tell us about what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it does, right? It does, what kind of predictive ability does all of this have? It gives us a temperature on what's happening right now, looks backward a little bit, but, you know, if you have a job now, are you going to have a job six months from now? I don't know. I don't think we have the answer. I don't know what data. I think everyone would like that crystal ball. Well, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the thing to me, though. It's like to criticize any piece of economic data on the basis of it being backward looking. It's like literally backward everything's backward, backward looking. looking. No right. one can see the future. There is, I mean, you know, you want to go into it? There's no future. Uh, <laughs> like if you break it down to that level, well, the future also, is AI takes all of our jobs. There's also no past, then we right? It's all, all we have is now and the infinite nows and all this kind of stuff. And so basically though, like <laughs> the market is, and this is why I like markets, because markets are trying to guess at the future and they give you information if you watch them closely about what an aggregation of investors believes the future will be. Today's reaction to the jobs report suggests investors think Future's that good. in the future, the economy will kind of chart the course that is slightly better than it's been, but not so much that we need to see a material change in how the Fed thinks about rates, which means you know you can you know buy the Dow, I guess, or whatever. You can buy <laughs> regional banks. Right, Today you can buy regional banks and a bunch of AI names and you know, MongoDB, whatever. But again, <laughs> that's the market telling you now what it's thinking because it's going to happen in the future, and no. its view can change. And then on we, Monday, right, or we well, get to and, that. And that's why we all have jobs. That's why this is Thank a good job. Goodness. That's why this is a good job because it's going to be different on Monday and next Thursday that's and three true. Thursdays after that. And we don't have to sit here and say like, you know, uh, are, are the Patriots going to win in week six next year? We don't have to wait for all that stuff. We just get they to. Will. Right? I mean, they might even have a buy. I don't even know. But it's like we don't have to wait for all that stuff. That's true. That's and my hopefully pitch. AI won't be able to do all of this. Fingers crossed. Hey, okay. I couldn't do this. <laughs> come on, come on. Rochelle, uh, we'll, we'll leave it there for now. <laughs> to be continued, back to you. A, a fantastic debate that you have the, the reality of the jobs market and the existential crisis that comes with it as well. Thank you so much, Julie, Joss, Sean, and Miles for that fantastic debate on the jobs data. All right, well, before we go, let's get you a final check of the markets. As we've seen here, still in positive territory, though, off some of the session highs at the moment. We're seeing the Dow, though, up about 555 points at 1.7%. The S&P also still rallying at 1.3% or 55 points. Tech heavy Nasdaq lagging the others, but still seeing good, good gains here, about 1% or 129 points. You have Congress with a debt relief deal, a hot and expected May jobs data, and that rising unemployment rate. Lots for investors to think about and mull, and potentially what the Fed might do next. Well, that does it for me, but I'll see you back here on Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern. See you then.